Welcome to Just a Minute. Yes. Hello. Thank you, thank you, hello. My name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, it is once more my pleasure to welcome the four outstanding and talented players of Just a Minute. We welcome back Paul Merton, who has only played the game a limited amount of time. With such outstanding effect, we are delighted he returns. And three players who have been with the show since it almost began. They are Derek Nimmo, Peter Jones and Clement Freud. But I would like you to welcome all four of them. This uh, particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Pleasance of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And as usual, I'm going to ask our four players to speak, if they can, on the subject that I give them, but they're going to try and do it without hesitation, repetition, or deviation. Beside me sits Elaine Wigley. She has a stopwatch. She will keep the score. And she also has a little whistle that she will blow when 60 seconds have passed. Let us begin the show this week with Clement Freud. Clement, the subject very apt for the show coming from Edinburgh, The Scotsman. Will you tell us something about the Scotsman in this game, starting now? The Scotsman is an excellent daily newspaper published in Edinburgh, and also, for those who are at the festival, a male kilt, usually wearing sandals, a kilt, and... Um, Paul Merton. <laughs> Two kilts. No, I thought the first one, you said, was a kilt, and the second one was a kilt. Isn't that right, Clement? One is a male kilt. Yes, what you said, yes. Kilt. So, uh, so he didn't repeat the word. So it was well... They loved hearing from you, Paul, so don't wait, don't be inhibited. I, but it was I, an in- I loved interrupting, if it's any help to anyone. Yeah. <laughs> it was an incorrect challenge, so Clement gets a point for that. He has uh, 47 seconds to continue on The Scotsman starting now. When the sun goes down over the Royal Mile, male Scotsmen can be found eating um, each other. Uh, Derek Nimmers. A repetition of male. That was a correct challenge, Derek. Well done. You get a point for a correct challenge. You take over the subject. 41 seconds are left. The Scotsman starting now. As Dr. Johnson said, the fairest sight that a Scotsman will ever see is the long road that leads to England. I think that was a very profound <laughs> remark. It's <laughs> <is> not actually... <laughs> <laughs> Quite Paul, soon. Paul Merton has challenged. Hmm. Well, basically, just to stop a lynching. <laughs> <laughs> After all these years, Derek hasn't yet discovered how to win friends and influence people. <laughs> Uh, so, other than the lynching, what else was your challenge, Paul? Well, it's deviation for a member of Just a Minute to be lynched by the audience. <laughs> <laughs> That's never happened before, I, I so think therefore it's deviation. I, I agree with you, as someone who's partly Scots, it is a devious thought. So, I think to save the lynching as well, we give you a point and the subject, Paul, and 27 seconds, the Scotsman starting now. When you first come up to the Edinburgh Fringe as a performer, you eagerly buy the Scotsman every night from the assembly rooms. There's a man who sells it there about quarter to twelve, and you look for it to see whether you've got a good review or not. If you get a bad one, you always blame it on the fact that, oh, it's just the gardening expert has written some review. And if you get a good one... Clement Freud challenge. Repetition of review. Mm. Yes, that is right, Clement. You cleverly got in with eight seconds. Another point. The subject, the Scotsman, starting now. Scotsmen are quite the nicest, most charming, (laughs) warm-hearted, clean, kind, sober... Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. In an attempt to be lynched, they're not. (laughs) (laughs) Deviation. He doesn't learn anything, does he? <laughs> it's not deviation. No, you could have had him for the repetition of Scotsman, but it's too late now. Yes. And he repeated the word... Could I have him for grovelling? <laughs> 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 you could, Peter, but it doesn't fit in with the rules of just a minute. No, fit it really. But it's lovely to hear from you. At least everybody's spoken I thought it was time moment. I broke my silence. <laughs> <laughs> And, Clement, you have another point, and you have three seconds on the Scotsman starting now. I am a creep. (laughs) (laughs) 
Whoever is speaking as the whistle is blown gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Clement Freud, and uh, he has taken the lead, naturally, at the end of that round. The next round, I think, Paul, will you like to take this one? It's my giddy aunt. 60 seconds, starting now. My great aunt, B.B. Chitwingler, was a wonderful woman. Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. Repetition of B. 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 <laughs> Well done, Derek. A correct challenge. It's been well done. <laughs> well done. And this is a name. I know, but it, we are in sound radio now. We may have an audience here at the Pleasance, but it's sound radio, so it's what as you hear it. What does that make? <laughs> because BB may be written as one word, but it can be interpreted. If you, say, if you say a word once, how can that be repetition? <laughs> Because you have said B and B, and that is repetition. And I think it was a justified challenge within the rules of just a minute. <laughs> the fact that you all hate Derek Nimmo has got nothing to do with the fact you're... that I Nicholas, always you're try there to... to stop mob rule, Nicholas. <laughs> I That's always try to be scrupulously fair, and so, Derek, you have a point, you have the subject. 55 seconds, my giddy aunt starting now. My giddy aunt was Fiona MacDonald. She was the most wonderful Scottish lady of tremendous beauty. <laughs> she used to waft herself over the Isle of Skye in little rowing boat, singing jolly songs that people greatly enjoyed. I put on a play called My Giddy Aunt, written by Mr Raymond Cooney, a considerable awful of passes. Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Hesitation. Yes, hesitation, I would agree, Clement. You have another point, and you have the subject. My giddy aunt, there are 38 seconds left, starting now. My giddy aunt joined Exit and tried to kill herself with a surfeit of euthymol, which, oddly enough, was totally ineffective because of the colour. Pink is a rotten shade for doing in with yourself, as many people told my giddy aunt that... Paul challenge. Doing in with yourself? Yeah. <laughs> no, doing yourself in would be better English, yes. And, uh, I... <laughs> and I think that is grammatically uh, devious. And, um, uh, but no, I think I give the benefit of the doubt to Paul, and so a point to him and the subject. <laughs> My giddy aunt, 20 seconds, starting now. She used to love going on carousels. She'd go down to the children's playground and the toddlers are saying, get off that lady, that's ours. Oh, no, I'm going to spin round here till midnight. And she often did. And sometimes the thing would actually spin off its axis and she'd go uh, down uh, the high street. Kind of oh, sorry, repetition of BB. I do beg your pardon. <laughs> Uh, uh, Clement, you challenge first. Repetition. Of what? Spin. That's right. Eight seconds, Clement. My giddy aunt, starting now. Gertrude Jemima was tremendously keen on roundabouts, known as hurdy-gurdies. She would go... Oh, no, Peter Jones a challenge. They're not known as hurdy-gurdies. Yeah. Oh, hurdy-gurdies are quite... They're not roundabouts. You're quite right, Peter. Well challenged, yes. Right. They're, they're those oh, things right. that you wind up. Those are the hurdy-gurdies. Right. Sorry, I've realised this is radio and I was demonstrating to the audience then I do apologise. I'm not quite sure what you're doing, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Paul, you're a different generation. You probably didn't see hurdy You've got a hobby, you know, you... you know, you carry on. <laughs> Peter and I are of the world of the hurdy-gurdy, you know. It's all gone plastic. Anyway, Peter, a correct challenge, and you've got him with one second to go. My giddy aunt, starting now. My giddy aunt. Hello. <laughs> Peter Jones. Speaking as the whistle wind, gain that extra point. The situation at the end of that round is Clement Freud is in a strong lead, but Paul Merton, Derek Nemo and Peter Jones are all equal in second place. Derek Nemo, will you begin the next round? The subject, Hay Fever, 60 seconds as usual, starting now. It was in the production of Hay Fever, given by the Goodless Wall Amateur Dramatic Society, that I met my bride, Patricia Sybil Ann Brown, some 42 years ago. She was playing Sorrel, and I was playing or depicting... Clement Freud challenge. Too much playing. Yes, there was too much playing going on, I'm afraid. <laughs> 46 seconds are available for Hay Fever with you, Clement, starting now. Hay Fever, in just a minute, is a pretty poor ailment in that it causes you to hesitate, deviate, and repeat yourself. Very <laughs> much. <laughs> Repetition of... <laughs> All different. 
Very correct challenge. 35 seconds available. Hay fever, back with you, starting now. Oh, I do hate going out in the summertime, getting all that pollen in my nose, and I feel absolutely frightful and ghastly, and I come and go into the cold shower and lie on the floor in that arrangement for quite a long time, until suddenly the last piece of Peter Jones has challenged you. Oh, he lied on the what? On the floor of the shower. I have a very big shower. He actually said he lies on the floor in that arrangement, so I didn't... I didn't want to repeat shower. That's I know I, you did. That's why I say you've got a big shower. <laughs> if you prefer to say that I am a big shower, that's up to you, but I... I, well, I, I, have a, I, I, I lie down in my shower, but I call it a bath. <laughs> Peter, I think that it's a bit devious lying down in a shower, so I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and say that you have 20 seconds to talk about Hay Fever starting now. It was one of these plays by Noel Coward where young people come in with tennis rackets and say, anybody ready for a game? And it's pretty <laughs> tedious, in my opinion. It was revived, or they tried to restore it to active life about 20 years ago, and the lady who played the leading part, an elderly actress... Peter Jones, you have leapt forward. It was not that extra point at the end of the round for speaking mm. when the whistle went. You are now in a strong second place just behind our leader, Clement Freud, and it is your turn to begin. The subject is jazz. Tell ah. us something about jazz in just a minute, starting now. It's made a great contribution to music, starting at the end of the last century and the beginning of this one with such magic names as Jelly Roll Morton and Bessie Smith and her representative on Earth now, George Melly, and a number of other people, <laughs> like uh, Django Reinhardt in France with Stéphane Grappelli, Humphrey Littleton over here, and a number of people <laughs> in... Derry Nimmo Challenge. Repetition of number. Yes, you did say right at the beginning a number of people. Oh, did I? Yes. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so... Derek got in with 34 seconds available on jazz, starting now. In Montségur, a little town in Aquitaine, southwest France, every year, at the end of June, beginning of July, they have a jazz festival. And it goes on for 24 hours. Every bar, restaurant in the town has jazz uh, Peter Jones. He did say every. Hmm. Yes, Twice. every, every. Probably. Yes. Peter, yeah, probably. you've got in again. Keen, 21 seconds. <laughs> Jazz, starting now. I won't say his first name, but Chisholm was a great trombonist, who still is, as far as I know, comes from this country and has played all over America and great success over here. Paul Merton challenge. Two overs. Two overs. Oh, dear. Yes, so oh dear. <laughs> two overs, two overs, and eight seconds for Paul to tell us something about jazz, starting now. Considered by many to be perhaps the greatest trumpeter in the jazz era is Miles Davis, who first came to public prominence in 1949. Paul Merton was then speaking as the whistle went, gained an extra point for doing so. He's in third place with Derek Nimmo, just behind Peter Jones. Clement Freud is still our leader. Clement, the subject now is grace. Will you tell us something about grace in just a minute, starting now? For me, Grace will always be Gracie Fields, a great singer who lived on the Isle of Capri. I... Paul Merton Charles. Deviation. I thought she was a rotten singer. <laughs> <laughs> Sally, Sally, it's rubbish. This is an impossible thing on which to make a decision, isn't it, really, in a way? But, no, the, yes. Well, it's a matter of opinion, isn't it? A lot of people don't Peter. think Miles Davis was the greatest musician in the world. <laughs> if you go by popularity, then uh, her popularity was such that she was considered to be a great singer. She was actually opera-trained. She did have a very fine voice, yes. but she ruined it by singing these popular songs. So I'm going to give the... <laughs> that is a fact, if you want to research it as well, but... Um... <laughs> Not now, perhaps. No, wait, wait till the show's <laughs> over, please. Uh, I so once paid to go and see her having tea on the Isle of Capri. She was a charge admission to watch her having cups of tea. Mm. Very nice. Part. Used to do the same with the monkeys in London Zoo, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that was about her level. Uh, uh, it is obvious that Paul is not a fan of Gracie Fields. He's established that. Clement, you have the benefit of my doubt, and there are another point to you. <laughs> 52 seconds, Grace, with you still, Clement, starting now. Grace came from Rochdale, which, if you live in London, is near Scotland. She was exceedingly well-known. And if you go to the town hall in that Yorkshire city, 
which many people think is in Lancashire, you will see pictures of her and her music swells around the altar on a Sunday and everyone says that is our grace. Oh, uh, right, the poorly challenged. Sorry, um, isn't, isn't Rochdale in Lancashire? Yeah. Rochdale is in Lancashire, yes. Because Clement said it was in Yorkshire. No. Yeah, you said Rochdale's in Yorkshire, but many people think it's in Lancashire. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, I've got the Gracie Fields biography. Yeah. Just been, uh, <laughs> if he said through. that, then that was devious and incorrect. So, Paul, you have uh, 27 seconds on Grace starting now. She was a wonderful performer, perhaps <laughs> the finest entertainer this country's ever produced. I could listen to her singing for hours. <laughs> Sally of the Alley was a wonderful song. And she used to... Um, st- uh, oh, uh, Derek. Was wonderful. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Derek, will you, you tell us something you? about Grace? <laughs> 16 seconds on Grace with you, Derek, starting now. For what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. Amen. The title for a duchess would be Her Grace, or the same named lady, of rank of Devonshire, perhaps. Devo to her child. Uh, and and Paul would challenge. Quite a few ofs, one after another. Yeah, uh, a tough challenge, but it's a bit true. Of a tough it's challenge. Well, it was it been two ofs. ofs in three words. Right. <laughs> if it's correct, I have to give it to them. Sometimes they overlook it, but on this occasion they didn't, so Paul got in with three seconds to go on Grace, starting now. Probably the finest woman that ever lived. Oh, uh, <laughs> Chan. We've had finest and woman yes. before. Well, we had greatest before. Yeah. Finest. Well, we've had woman before. Hmm. <laughs> well, we all <laughs> have. Well, not all of us. <laughs> it's yeah. devious, because he was knocking her at the beginning of his minute, and now he's praising her, and it doesn't add up. <laughs> I was, I was won over by Clement's eulogy of her. <laughs> a lot of people think she was born in Yorkshire, you know. <laughs> she, she was an opera singer, but she ruined her voice with a pop song. <laughs> Go to the Isle of Capri, two pounds or two, having a cup of tea. <laughs> so I'll never be another. <laughs> with a probably, bit of luck. You're probably used to... Clement, you got him with one second to go on Grace starting now. Grace Kelly is another. <laughs> so Clement Freud was speaking as the whistle went, and uh, extra point and others in the round, he's increased his lead. Paul Merton, will you take the next round? The subject, fossils. Will you tell us something about those? <laughs> I know what you're thinking. <laughs> that young spark's going to have a go now. <laughs> That chairman's a bit of a fossil, isn't he? Yes, right. Fossils is with you, Paul. 60 seconds, starting now. Millions of years ago, a meteorite landed on this planet, and a lot of scientists believe it came from Mars, and they've recently examined this particular fragment and have found an organism inside, or rather a fossil of the very aforementioned thing, which could perhaps prove that somewhere there is a parallel Nicholas Parsons (laughs) working on a far distant moon. Ah, but he'd be a different kind of individual, because in a similar universe... Oh, no, I can't. (laughs) Couldn't think of another word for parallel. Uh, Peter, you challenge first. Um, What was it? He stopped. Yes, he did. He did stop. You're quite right. Hesitation. 34 seconds. Fossils, Peter, starting now. The best place to collect fossils is the coast of Dorset. And my advice to you is to hire a caravan or caravette and take your children, as I took mine, with several cases of scotch. And we, (laughs) while they combed the beaches looking for these bits of old things, which wasn't very interesting to me, uh, I stayed inside. It was pouring with rain, and I thought it served them right for being interested in such bizarre things. (laughs) But they did survive, and they brought a number of them back, which we have... So Peter's tragic story kept going until the whistle went again, that extra point. He's increased his position in second place. He's closer to our leader, Clement Freud. The other two follow just behind. And Derek Nomo, your turn to begin. The subject, wisdom. Will you tell us something about wisdom in just a minute, starting now? We are extraordinarily lucky to have on this programme, as our chairman, a man who is truly, deeply wise. Wisdom can be an underrated quality these days, but Nicholas Parsons has the wisdom of Solomon. Give him a baby and ask him to cut it up. 
<laughs> Paul Merton Challenge. There's only so much of this you can listen to. <laughs> I don't know why you're clapping. <laughs> so, your challenge, Paul. I'd say I'm challenging this deviation to say that you've got the wisdom of Solomon. Well, Same I... birthday, perhaps, but not... <laughs> 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 to be utterly fair, I show you, show you that I can uh, endeavour to display the wisdom of Solomon. What I will do on this occasion is give Paul a bonus point for his challenge, which we all enjoyed, but leave the subject with Derek Nimmo, who also gets a point for being interrupted, and he continues with 43 seconds on wisdom starting now. I do like that awfully jolly little comedian with the cloth cap, don't you? Norman, wisdom. <laughs> Funny fellow, I think. He's falling over all the time. And I must say, I'm in absolute guffaws whenever I see it. Now he's coming out of the back cupboard and he's going to make another uh, Peter movie. Jones' challenge. He said he was in guffaws. Is that right? No, not really. You're well, either guffaw, but you're not in guffaws. <laughs> it's again one of those difficult decisions. Often we let it pass, but if you challenge and it is... Uh, um, you let it pass if you no, like. No, you know. no, no. <laughs> it's a mind. subtle... If, 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 it's if a you subtle... want to go home, I'm quite happy. With it. <laughs> I don't mind. Or have lunch, whatever it is you have in <laughs> mind. Subtle deviation from English as we speak it and understand it. So, Peter, you have the benefit of the doubt, you have another point, you have the subject, you have 30 seconds, you have wisdom, starting now. Well, I was in a film with Norman Wisdom, and one day, when the camera broke down, we were all told to wait in our dressing rooms until it was repaired, which was going to be a very long time. So I suggested to Norman that he tell me his... Clement Foy challenge. Repetition of Norman. Yes, Norman's not on the card, only wisdom, I'm afraid. What a pity. I know, it's a good story. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, you've got the sympathy of the audience, I can say that anyway. <laughs> Clement, 15 seconds, wisdom starting now. Some years ago, though it may still exist, there was a toothbrush called Wisdom, and you were recommended to use it with a paste named GL35, which contained all those ingredients which kept pluck either on. <laughs> Well, Clement Freud's points, including the extra one to speak and the whistle went, has increased his lead at the end of that round. Peter Jones, your turn to begin. Fat cats, that is the subject. Tell us something about them in just a minute, starting now. Well, they really get up my nose, I must say. All those men... Derry Nimmo challenge. Deviation, how can a fat cat get up his nose? <laughs> If you use getting up one's nose as, a, as an expression of being irritated or disturbed by somebody, then it is a perfectly possible, and it is therefore not deviation. 57 seconds. Peter, you still have the subject. Another point, fat cats, starting now. I'm thinking of these directors who vote each other golden handshakes and share bonuses and all kinds of uh, odd things that nobody in the normal course of business would expect in their course of duty. But... Clearly, no more challenge. Two courses. Two courses. Course of business, course of duty. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Derek, you in with the correct challenge on this occasion, and 42 seconds are available for you to tell us something about fat cats. I would really like to be a fat cat, and people to give me massive... Peter Jones' challenge. You are a fat cat. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, to be fair again and show that wisdom that Derek talked about, I will give you a bonus point for a challenge that everybody enjoyed, but Derek Nimmer was interrupted, so he also gets a point, but he continues with the subject for being interrupted, and 37 seconds still available to you, Derek. Fat Cats, what starting now. What name? Wasn't it Brown or something? He was chairman of British Gas, who got a tremendous amount of money for what seemed to me to be very little indeed, like the chairman of your Yorkshire, 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 uh, Yorkshire, um, Yorkshire. <laughs> chairman challenged. To chairman. Yes, that's right, uh, Clement. 28 seconds. Fat cats with you, now starting. If you get a cat, or perhaps another one, and feed it all the food that you can find, <laughs> sausages and mushrooms, bits of egg, dried toast, grape nuts and cream, hot and cold milk, distilled water, and especially a test tube whereby you can shoot... Nutritive ingredients um, up in Jones too long. A bit of a hesitation there. I think there was. I think he was trying to keep going on um, ingredients and he just slipped up a little and or hesitated. And two seconds are available for you, Peter. Got in just before the end on Fat Cats, starting now. And their wives drive around in company cars. <laughs> So we 
are moving into the last round. So, Paul, it's your turn to begin. A very apt subject to finish on, the Stuarts. Will you tell us something about that very Scottish subject in this Scottish edition of Just a Minute, starting now? I believe Charles I was a Stuart. He was the son of James VI of Scotland. And, of course, he came into an enormous amount of difficulty round about 1641 when he wanted to wage war against the uh, country north of the border and Parliament wouldn't grant him the money to do so. So it turned out that there was an English civil confrontation between the parliamentarians... <laughs> uh, um, Derek Nimmo a little word, a confrontation. Confrontation. But, uh, I was trying to avoid saying war again. Uh, but you got the word out even though it did come out through your nose instead of your mouth. Um, it's a good <laughs> trick if you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't stop there. Right. <laughs> So, if any bit of the doubt to you, Paul, you keep going 37 seconds on the Stuarts starting now. So, Oliver Cromwell basically cut his head off in 1649, and that brought to an end the reign of the Stuarts. So, <laughs> yeah, no more challenge. Not, not permanently. No, no, but for a while. <laughs> well, it would be, wouldn't it? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so, what is, so, what is your challenge? Well, it's TV. They brought to the end of the reign of the Stuarts. Yes, but as he the said, Stuarts it, went into exile. They went into exile. They'd never given up the throne. Oh, gosh, they didn't give it up for good. No, they did temporarily go into exile. Um, Oh, I don't know. Paul, you have 30 seconds to continue on the stewards starting now. It's a bit of a shame, because I don't know much more about them, really. (laughs) But I know that the uh, Duke of Buckingham was a very good friend of the uh, previous... Derek Nimmo challenge. Hesitation. Yes, there was a definite error there. So, Derek, you've got 21 seconds to tell us something about the stewards starting now. I have a particular admirer of James I, who was known by the Scottish king as the wisest fool in Europe. I think that it... Paul, challenge. Deviation, the wisest fool in Christendom. Wisest fool in Christendom, not in Europe. <laughs> well done. Uh, 13 seconds for you, Paul, on the Stuarts, starting now. There was a man who lived next door to him who was known as the most idiotic mantle... Oh. Uh, <laughs> Clement Freud challenged. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Hesitation. Clement, eight seconds. The Stuarts, starting now. The Stuarts get up my nose. All of them. From James I, who was the sixth of Scotland, to his son. Well, as I said before we began that round, there wouldn't be any more time to continue at the end of it. Uh, A very fair result. A few points are separated them, but who's counting points? Probably the players. Well, I do get letters about the points, actually. Um, Derek Nimmo... Somebody writes to you, isn't it? (laughs) Paul Merton and Derek Nimmo, they finished equal in third place. They were only one point behind Peter Jones, who gave his usual good value, didn't quite overtake our leader. Clement Freud, you had most points, so you are the winner this week. Congratulations. So it only remains to say thank you to our four outstanding players of this game, Paul Merton, Clement Freud, Peter Jones and Derek Nimmo, Ian Messiter, who created the game and goes on keeping us all in work like this, our producer, Anne Jobson, Elaine Wigley, who's kept the score, blown her whistle, and particularly this delightful, excitable audience <laughs> at the Pleasance on the Fringe in Edinburgh. And from me, Nicholas Parsons, from all of us, till we take to the air once more and play just a minute. Goodbye and thank you. <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome the four exciting performers who this week are going to play just a minute. We welcome back one of our regular players, that is Paul Merton. We welcome back two of the original players of the game, that is Derek Nimmo and Peter Jones, and someone who's never played the game before, that is Neil Malarkey. Would you please welcome all four of them?
Beside me sits Yolanta Zabuki, who's going to keep the score and blow a whistle when 60 seconds are up. And this particular edition of Just a Minute comes from the delightful Swan Theatre in the ancient city of Worcester. And we have before us a very animated and exciting Worcester audience <laughs> who have come from their homes in order to cheer us on our way. And I ask our four players to speak if they can on the subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition or deviation. And let us begin the show this week with Paul Merton. Paul, a very apt subject on which to begin, Swan. Would you tell us uh, something about Swan in this game starting now? It is little known fact that the Queen is Perth... Oh. <laughs> I said it was little known. <laughs> I found out I, I didn't know it yes, myself. I think that's... <laughs> but it is difficult when you've suddenly been waiting to go and suddenly something happens and it's... You've been waiting for three seconds, Paul. Mm. <laughs> but I'll do it again tomorrow. <laughs> Derek, you challenged. Well, it was days and he stopped. Of course it was, yes. <laughs> And there are 57 seconds left. Swan starting now. In Western Australia, they have black swans. And south of the river, which has the same name, they produce some of the finest chardonnays in vineyards like Hortons and Sandlefords. But everywhere you can see these swan noir, which I have to say like that because I don't want to repeat myself. But the Queen actually is head of the swans in England for some reason. Neil Malarkey challenge. Did you say Queen? Yes. Didn't Paul say Queen as well? No, but he did repeat swans. <laughs> <laughs> well, far be it. Aren't you allowed to say the name on the card? No, no, you can repeat the word on the card, which is in the singular, and he repeated it in the plural, and as you've never played the game before, I've helped you a little, so... Uh, <laughs> Neil, you have 32 seconds. You take over the subject, you get a point for a correct challenge, and you start now. Swan is my favourite method of perambulation. I like to swan about Tesco's, looking at the butter counter. I like to walk around the little place where you find the Vesta meals, where you can find all sorts of... Paul Merton challenge. Repetition of fine. You were finding far too much there. <laughs> That's Tesco's for you. <laughs> 17 seconds are available for you, Paul. You have the subject of Swan back again, and you start now. Many people think of them as a rather elegant bird, those huge white wings, the yellow beak. They also have a rather nasty temperament. Have you ever seen a swan after 15 pints of lager? <laughs> it is a sight to behold. It'll take on anybody, taxi drivers, members of the Royal... Whoever is speaking when the whistle goes gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Paul Merton, and he is in the lead at the end of the round, which is not surprising. And, Peter, it's your turn to begin. Another excellent subject for Worcester, though nobody took up Swan into the Swan Theatre here, which does such a wonderful work presenting repertory the theatre. <laughs> Are you, are you plugging your one-man show? No. <laughs> I've done my one-man show here, actually, at the Swan Theatre, and it was uh, well-received, but they keep... <laughs> I'm not looking for a turn engagement, but I will be free if they want to ask me. They, uh, but they, it didn't, is that uh, they didn't mention the famous book by Marcel Proust, either, did they? Swan's Way. I thought I'd mention that because it gives the whole thing a different uh, tone. <laughs> It shows the intellectual quality that you possess. Yeah, exactly, yes. Good. I only know the name of it. I've never read it. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, will you now take another Worcester subject, Cavaliers? Talk on the subject, if you can, 60 seconds, starting now. Well, I come from a small town in Shropshire where they supported Oliver Cromwell. And one of the first... Uh, one of the f They don't forget things in a hurry, do they? <laughs> <laughs> One of the first verses I ever heard was the women of Wem and a few volunteers beat Lord Capel and all his cavaliers. And there was a river that was allegedly running with blood for a while, quite near their tributary of the Severn, which flows, as you know, through Shrewsbury and then comes here. So you may have had a rather pink uh, <laughs> river by that time. Derry Nimmo Challenge. Revolution of river. Yes, you, you did repeat the river, I'm afraid, yes, Peter, yes. yes. Uh, so, Derek, you have the subject of Cavaliers. 
21 seconds are available, starting now. I suppose, for me, the most dashing of all the Cavaliers was the gallant Prince Rupert, who rode to the head of the cavalry and charged the Ironsides with such fervour and set them mostly to flight. Although, sadly, in the end, the king had to flee and hid himself in an oak tree. Well, Paul Merton Challenge. Are you mixing up Charles I with Charles II? No. <laughs> Because Charles, it was Charles II that hid in an oak tree. Mm. He hid in about 14,000 oak trees. <laughs> Paul has the benefit of the doubt. He has Cavaliers two seconds ago, starting now. A lot of Cavaliers come from Vauxhall. <laughs> So Paul Merton was again speaking as the whistle went, having cleverly got in with only two seconds to go, and has increased his lead at the end of the round. And Derek Nimmo, your turn to begin. The subject is <laughs> fiestas. Will you tell us something about? <laughs> is it some way I pronounced it or something? It's a little joke, you see. We talked about cavaliers and fiestas. That's what I love. <laughs> They're both names of motor cars. I thought Cavaliers was a group of stripping men who were <laughs> cavorted about with oiled bodies. That's the Chippendales. <laughs> uh, that's also Nicholas Parsons' one-man show as well. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. Yes. No wonder he hasn't been asked to come back again. <laughs> I actually followed a gay beauty competition in a show I was doing the other day, which was quite an experience. How you're, far you're did in... you have to follow them? <laughs> <laughs> I think we should get on with just a minute. <laughs> uh, fiestas, uh, Derek, 60 seconds, starting now. Feast days are fiestas, and we don't really have very many of them in this country. Sadly, the Spanish go in for them quite a lot, and jolly good fun they are. Carnivale, farewell to meat, but well, I suppose we'll all be saying that now. But that is the beginning of Lent. Shrove Tuesday, if you go to the Mardi Gras in Rio, I've got a very good friend who is actually a carnival queen. But she is a real big Juno spoon who gets on top of her lorry and she has a samba troupe behind her. And when the fiesta starts, you hear the maracas banging around and she bangs around too, which is too bad. <laughs> Myself. I said uh, twice. I saw you, Neil, Neil got you on the banging. I'm so sorry, yes. Sir. <laughs> you challenged Neil. Well, he said bangs and banging. They're not the same, They're word. Not the same word, are they? So, so I... it's a wrong challenge. You get a point for that, Derek. You keep the subject. And you've got 22 seconds left. Fiestas starting now. Nicholas Parsons like going to gay fiestas. He's so jolly and forthright <laughs> that they all welcome him with open arms and say, Come on, Nick, get your knees up. Or worse, rather, <laughs> and you put on a pretty little dress and skip around, handing out pamphlets, newspapers, magazines, anything you ask for. Uh, Neil Malarkey, challenge again. Uh, you had said magazines before. There were magazines before, before. Yes, I'm sorry. Anything to get away from this subject. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, Neil, you've cleverly got him with only two seconds to go. A point for that, of course, and the subject fiesta's starting now. I used to drive a Ford Fiesta. <laughs> Now, Neil, you are in second place, only one point behind our leaders, who are Paul uh, Merton and Derek Nimmo uh, together. Neil, it's um, about time you started a round. And the subject we have for you now is improvising. Will you talk on the subject starting now? Improvising is that art form also known as extemporising, where you enter the stage without the slightest idea of what you might recount to the audience. They have paid good money to see this alleged performance, and yet they know not the quality that will ensue. But it is happily an event that makes so many of us pleased and rewards us with many financial incentives. <coughs> Derek Nimmo, well, just a many. You kept saying many, I'm afraid, Neil. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> But I was spelling it differently each time. <laughs> 32 seconds are available for you improvising, uh, Derek, starting now. I think a jolly good idea for a game would get people to improvise and speak for a minute on a subject without repetition, hesitation or deviation. Uh, Paul Merton challenge. It'll never catch on. <laughs> Uh, 
give Paul a bonus point because we enjoyed the challenge, but he actually uh, wasn't deviating from just a minute of the rules. So, Derek, you keep the subject improvising, and there are, and got a point, of course, for being interrupted. 24 seconds starting now. And you're going to have playing the buzzer or the bell. Someone call Peter Jones a challenge. You don't blow a buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. Of course you don't. Yeah, you're right. absolutely right, Peter. <laughs> Definite deviation. Peter, tell us something about improvising. 20 seconds, starting now. Well, we British have a reputation for being marvellous at improvisation. Wonderful example of that was the man who did an operation on an aeroplane and with a coat hanger and a rubber band or something, and he was able to avoid this woman dying of appendectomy. Is that what it is? Yes, something like that. Uh, Neil Madarki challenge. I, I don't think you die of an appendectomy. You do if you do it with a coat hanger. <laughs> And so, Peter, you have another point, and you still have the subject, and only one second left, improvising starting now. Make it up, that's what you do. <laughs> So, Peter Jones, speaking as the whistle wind, got that point, and he's now moving to second place with Neil Malarkey, and they're just behind Paul Merton and Derek Nimmer, who is our leader. And uh, Paul Merton, now show your talent of improvisation as you take the next subject of dropping a clangor starting now. Well, I believe this phrase emanates from the realms of campanology, bell ringing. If you drop a clangor, it's because you haven't come in at the right point of the particular instrument that you're playing. For example, if you hear a bong, bing, bang, like that, then the <laughs> other noise I just made might well be in the wrong place. The other thing about... <coughs> Neil Malarkey challenge. Did you say wrong twice? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I accept that. Sorry, Neil. Interrupt. <laughs> I can make my own decisions. Is that right? <laughs> well, you did say it. You mean? No, I didn't. No, oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. But Paul, you have another po point and 40 seconds dropping a clangor starting now. I worked on the first series of the clangers, but clearly there was too many and one of them had to go. So I had them all in my office and the soup dragon was there as well. And I said, look, there's seven clangers, but we only have room for six. And I didn't know how to pick out which one was to be the one who had to go down to the... Peter Jones, a challenge. Repetition of one. Yes. Yes. That's right. So, Peter, you're in there. And with... I did say wrong twice earlier. <laughs> <laughs> So I have dropped a clangor. <laughs> well, you've got to give two points to, to Neil for that. Uh, Peter, there are 25 seconds for you on dropping a clangor starting now. John Gielgud was and still is famous for his clangors. When he saw George Ralph and Miles Mallison coming towards him in the pavement, he said, ah, my favorite Polonius. And each of the two actors had played it with him. And so they didn't know and quarreled for the rest of the time it took them to get home. Uh, that obviously wouldn't have been recognised <laughs> as a uh, clanger. Let me challenge you. Hesitation. You oh. did hesitate, yes. Uh, you waited for the laugh. Which they didn't come hesitated, yet. actually. <laughs> <laughs> but Derek, you've got him with four seconds to go on dropping a clanger starting now. Well, I dropped a clanger a few moments ago uh, when I Peter said Jones that. Jones you. Well, he said well again. He didn't say well. Didn't he? He did say well, actually. Yes. You did start off with well, yes, definitely. But no, did he say I well? I haven't talked about a clang he before. Hasn't talked, <laughs> he, he, he hasn't spoken in this round yet. Well, if he had, he would have said well. <laughs> Give Peter a bonus point. Derek, you have a one for being interrupted. You keep the subject three seconds, dropping a clang. St. Peter Just... and St. Paul. I have to get in quickly. Uh, Paul Merton will... challenged. Repetition of Saint. Yeah. St. Peter. <laughs> It's a tough game. You've got him with one second to go, Paul, on dropping a clangor. Starting now. I think it was John G... <laughs> uh... <laughs> right, so... Paul Merton got that extra point. What's the score? Very close, actually. Paul Merton is now in the lead, just one point ahead of Derek Nimmo. And then equal in third place, uh, Peter Jones and Neil Malarkey, not far behind. Peter Jones, this subject is worrying me before we start, because <laughs> <laughs> it's old Nick... I don't know what they're going to say. <laughs> but, uh, Peter, you begin anyway, uh, starting now. Well, old Nick is actually older than you would think. Of course, I knew him first when I was a boy. He was already growing up and going out with girls, 
Lillian Braithwaite, Edith Evans, <laughs> uh, a number of uh, women come to mind. But uh, I was taken with by my uh, parents. <laughs> Derek Nimmo challenge. Was a lot of hesitation. Sort of uh, well, not right, a lot, yes. there was a little hesitation. Yeah, yeah. Derek, you've got in on old Nick, and the 40 seconds are available starting now. I certainly wouldn't like to get in with old Nick. He is the chairman of this game. He's much older than you think he is. He is, in fact, over 70, but God, isn't he wonderfully preserved? His dear present wife, Anne, who's in the audience this evening, she knows that he has the figure that many younger men by 50 years would die for. And when you've seen him on the Swan Theatre covering Vaseline, doing his one-man show, you will realise how splendid old Nick is. It can, of course, be used as a word for the devil. Nicodemus. Sometimes one might almost think that ah, oh, Nick is a bit of one of those too. But he isn't really. He's a charm. <laughs> Just when Derek started to pay me a compliment, they blew the whistle. I was just, um... But Derek, you were speaking as that whistle went, gained that extra point, and you've now gone into the lead just ahead of Paul Merton. You've changed positions, and Derek, it's your turn to begin. The subject is clubs. Can you tell us something about that uh, subject in just a minute, starting now? The Literary Club was founded by David Garrick, Dr Johnson, Sir Joshua Reynolds, Oliver Glazer-Smith, and that wonderful parson from Eastern Mordet, Dr Percy. Who is... I've said Dr. Twice. I'm um, um, Right. Uh, <laughs> Paul, no. Yes, Dr. Twice. Paul, 46 seconds for clubs with you starting now. I don't belong to any clubs, but I often... <laughs> <laughs> Neil Malarkey. Well, he did hesitate, but I want to know what you often do. No. <laughs> yeah. The reason why I hesitate, I had no idea. <laughs> well, you don't do it often enough. No, then, no. Right? <laughs> I do, but I quickly forget about it. <laughs> I thought you thought about what you often do, and it made you hesitate, because you couldn't mention it on radio. <laughs> How dare you! <laughs> I will dare anything with you, Paul. After some of the things you said oh, about thanks being very a much. <laughs> right, um, forty-two seconds for you, Neil. Club starting now. You're the one with the large gay following. <laughs> Whoever he may be. <laughs> right, um, Neil, um, clubs, 42 seconds, starting now. I am a member of a club. The requirement to join is the ability to save... Oh. <laughs> Paul Merton challenge. Well, Neil's just made a silly noise. <laughs> <laughs> just speaking rubbish. I mean, making... do you know this club? It it's could be. It, club. it could be that in this particular club that Neil's in, they have to say... <laughs> in yeah. order to get you have found a member, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This is the You don't know anything, do you? <laughs> you don't know if you're in this club, you don't know where you are, you've got a large gay following. <laughs> But I do, do know does. one thing. I give you very good clues in order to come back. Cues, I'm sorry, clues. <laughs> so you're giving this to Neil for the it, Silly it Noise Club? I'm yes. giving it against you for your challenge. I don't know. They might have to, in his club, make that silly noise. I don't know. The benefit of the doubt goes to Neil. Benefit he... of the doubt? <laughs> All right, go on. Right. 34 seconds, clubs, Neil, starting now. There. Uh, almost done. <laughs> Hesitation. No! <laughs> Oh, you're bitter, aren't you? you... <laughs> right, it's 33... just they wouldn't let him in, he no, couldn't say it. No. Yeah. 33 seconds, Neil, with you, starting now. They... Oh, definitely hesitation on that. No, he wasn't hesitation. <laughs> Very slow. Uh, Very uh, slow. Get off the muck a bit quick. I don't know how to do it again. 32 seconds, club, starting now. Barbara Cartland is a member, as indeed is Anthony... Uh, somebody, uh, Paul Merton. Repetition of member. Yep. Yes, a member. He did repeat member, and you can't have too many members. Uh, <laughs> but... Unless you've got a large gay following. <laughs> They're a very quick audience in Worcester. <laughs> and I think I'm going to say no more, but that Paul Merton has 29 seconds to tell us something about clubs starting now. I belong to this club where you have to make a very silly noise if you want <laughs> to be a member. The sound is something like... Uh, Derek Nemo Chubb. Repetition. <laughs> 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 now, 
Uh, it's hyphenated. Yes. <laughs> I know, but it came out without the hyphen. Right, uh, uh, Derek, uh, correct challenge, 20 seconds. Club starting now. Clubland is that part of Pall Mall which starts with the Athenaeum, moves on to the Reformed Travellers, on to the Royal Automobile <laughs> Club, known uh, as... Merton challenge. Repetition of onto. Onto, yes. It moved on to, and then it moved on to again. <laughs> Twelve seconds, clubs. Back with you, Paul, starting now. There is a Nicholas Parsons fan club that consists... Uh, Peter Jones Challenge. I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> and I show you how, how genuine and fair and, 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 and just I am. I will give you a bonus point because the audience enjoyed it, even though it was a rotten joke. <laughs> Paul, you were interrupted, so you get a point, and you have nine seconds left on clubs starting now. Some clubs have a club tie where the members can show you... <coughs> Derek Nimmer, Charlie. Repetition of members. Mm. Yes. Five <laughs> seconds for you, Derek, clubs starting the now. The oldest club in London was founded in 1693, and it is... Neil right. Malarkey challenged you before. Did you say London before? Yes, you talked about the London clubs down yeah, Pall Mall. Clubland, I said. But you did mention Pall Mall. Yes, and I think you mentioned no. London. No, I didn't. <laughs> I'm prepared to accept because Derek's got an honest face. <laughs> Derek, three seconds, club starting now. I think perhaps the best club of all was the Playboy. Uh, Paul Merton challenge. Repetition of best. Yes, you did say the best, Pal Mal, and when you were talking about that. I didn't say the best. I said, well, they started starting club and I moved along. I said he was best. I well, think I you said one club was better than another. I think you did say they were the best. Paul, you have another point. You have one second club starting now. The Athenaeum. <laughs> so, Paul Merton has increased his lead at the end of that round, but he's only two ahead of Derek Nimmo and only um, three or four ahead of Neil Malarkey and then Peter Jones in that order. And, Neil, your turn to begin. And the subject, guides. Will you tell us something about those or them starting now? I encountered guides on a holiday to Morocco. We were warned against faux guides, or false guides, as they are known by those who may speak English or fragmented French. But I know nothing of these bad guides, for we avoid them like the plague. They would lead you to their uncle. You would be forced to buy slippers of dubious quality <laughs> and spices of very nefarious afterthoughts and consequences. <laughs> <laughs> what are spices of nefarious <laughs> art? <laughs> well, you know, you said earlier you said you something you do something often. Yes, yes. you take those spices of nefarious afterthoughts. <laughs> Deviation from the English language, I claim. <laughs> 29 seconds are available for guides with you, Paul, starting now. You see them walking around various parts of London. They usually are holding up some newspaper and they've got surrounded loads of Japanese tourists around them and they... Neil Markey challenge. I, I, th I think he said he, they've got surrounded or something. I think they got around them, around them. He yes. did repeat around, yes. Neil, you got back in, listened well, 18 <laughs> seconds. Guides still with you starting now. I applied to join the guides because I like blue, not green, as worn by the Cubs. <laughs> but... Peter Jones challenge. I didn't hear the last bit. <laughs> Your own version of Justin. <laughs> <laughs> you all right now, Peter? You, yeah, you're back I was all right side, before. Yes? There's nothing wrong. With you. <laughs> you didn't right. hear him, and I know. But the thing is, it's not part of the normal way of playing. Just a minute. So what happens is Neil was interrupted. He gets a point for that. He has 12 seconds to continue. Guides are starting now. My application was turned down on the grounds of gender. I was not female. Male being my sex. Oh, I cried at the board of. Very uh, never challenged. Deviation. Why? Well, I don't think it is his sex. <laughs> well, I'm not going to ask him to prove it in well, front of his <laughs> Neil, you have another point. You're doing extraordinarily well. First time. Three seconds available. Guides starting now. I took the case to the High Court. The Queen of... <laughs> So, Neil Malarkey, who's not played this game on the radio before, um, in that round started with the subject and actually finished with it, and he's moved into second place, only two points behind our leader, who is still Paul Merton. Uh, Peter, 
The last round, we'd like you to take it. It's what pleases me most. A good subject after all the discussion we've had here. Yeah? But will you tell us something about that in this game, starting now? Well, I hate first nights, so I don't go anymore, either as an actor or a member <laughs> of the audience. I don't have anything to do with it. I stay at home, and when I read in the paper that one is taking place that evening, I just raise a glass of red wine, very good Italian stuff, three ninety nine, an absolute snip. I'll give you the name after. <laughs> and give my best regards uh, to the Paul people Hurt who are taking Charlotte. part in it. Hesitation? No, no. <laughs> Peter, there are 37 seconds to continue on what pleases me most, starting now. Because I feel I'm so happy that I'm not participating in this dreadful bloodbath that is probably occurring on the stage and in the audience. A new malarkey challenge. He, he said stage earlier. Yes, I yes did. you yes, did. Yes. You're very honest, Peter, not like the rest of them. Oh, <laughs> come, come. Uh, Neil, you've got him with 28 seconds on what pleases me most, starting now. What pleases me most is eating sushi. I love the taste of raw salmon and enveloped by white rice and a piece of seaweed. Yummy, I say, as I pop it into my little buccal cavity, swallowing it with some Asahi beer or Pirin lager or Sapporo. Paul Burton Challenge. I think I speak for a lot of people. <laughs> uh, when I inquire as to what a buccal cavity is. I mean, I expect you know, because you've got a large gay following. <laughs> Paul, you have a correct challenge, because it was a deviation from English and uh, also anatomy, as we understand it. And uh, you have ten seconds to tell us something about what, what pleases... Oh, dear, I can't even say it now. What <laughs> pleases me most, starting now. What pleases me most is to go home and polish up me buccal cavity. I get a load of silver... <laughs> Neil Malarkey challenge. Uh, I said buccal cavity. I know you did, but he, re he used the I phrase. Can, I can repeat what you, you said. Can, but you, but you can't. I'll leave now. <laughs> so he's polishing what up. What is his... a buccal cavity? I've no idea. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I've been polishing it for years. <laughs> Four seconds, Paul. What pleases me most starting now? I suppose what pleases me most amongst all the experiences that life's rich. <laughs> So we have no more time to play just a minute and Paul Merton was speaking to us when again that extra point for doing so. Let me give you the final score. <laughs> Peter was only just in fourth, no third place only because in second place equal was our first time player of the game, Neil Malarkey and Derek Nimmo. So let's give a round of applause to Neil right away, shall we? But only a few points ahead was Paul Merton. So we say, Paul, you're the winner this week. Congratulations. We do hope you have enjoyed this particular edition of Just a Minute. It only remains for me to thank uh, Paul Merton, Neil Malarkey, Peter Jones, Derek Nimmo, and also Yolanta Zabuki for keeping the score, blowing the whistle so magnificently. Also, we must thank Ian Mester, who created the game and thought of the subjects for us, and also our producer, Anne Jobson, and also from me, Nicholas Parsons, from all of us here. Goodbye. Thank you for tuning in. Be with us the next time we play Just a Minute. <laughs> And next week's team will be Paul Merton, Peter Jones, Clement Freud and Graham Norton. Welcome to Just a Minute. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome the four outstanding players of Just a Minute who have joined me this week. We welcome two young comedians who have shone in Just a Minute with such excellence we cannot let them go. That is Paul Merton and Graham Norton. And two other comedians of a different generation who've shone equally well for more years than the other two. That is Peter Jones and Clement Freud. Would you please welcome all four of them? <laughs> 
Beside me sits Elaine Wigley, and she's going to keep the score, and she will blow a whistle when 60 seconds are up. And as usual, I will ask our four players of the game to speak, if they can, on the subject that I give them, and they will try and do that, as usual, without hesitating, repeating themselves, or deviating from the subject which is on the card in front of me. And we begin the show this week with Paul Merton, and who better, Paul, what an interesting subject, pressing the flesh. (laughs) <laughs> Would you talk about that in this game starting now? I love sausages, I really do And there's nothing I enjoy more than getting up in the middle of the night And getting a couple of chipolatas out of the old fridge And giving them a squeeze like that And it's wonderfully exotic for me And a fairly sensuous experience, I should say I don't know how the sausage itself reflects on this It might be, as far as it's concerned, rather inconvenient to be woken up in the middle of the night But I... Clement Freud has challenged. Repetition. Of what? Middle of the night. The middle of the night, yes. Clement, you have a correct challenge, so you take (coughs) over the subject of pressing the flesh. There are 35 seconds available starting now. Pressing the flesh is another way of saying shaking hands, a very important function for any politician, a practice which I pursued for some 15 years. And it was very difficult because people tried to give you a sort of message as their hand grasped yours. And you said, ah, you... Paul Merton challenge. Repetition of hand. No, hands and hand. Yes. Oh? Yes, it was the same as you had sausage and sausages on the first time. Oh, yeah. So we have to listen very carefully, Paul. Yes, we do, yeah. And so it was an incorrect challenge, so mm. Clement has another point for that. He keeps the subject. There are 16 seconds on pressing the flesh starting now. You are a Freemason, I would say. No, I have arthritis, was the reply. <laughs> it became very difficult. But it is something, pressing the flesh is a wonderful way of getting to know people because... Paul Merton challenge. Repetition of people. Yes, you did have people before. Sorry, Clement. Can't um, shake hands with non-people. Can <laughs> uh, Paul, you've gone in with four seconds to go on pressing the flesh starting now. During Nicholas Parsons' porno film career, I was often called upon to press the flesh. And what was... <laughs> audience are in a slight state of shock after that because they don't know whether it's true or not. It's uh, true. Or, it is true. Is that. Whoever is speaking when the whistle is blown gains an extra point. And on this occasion it was Paul Merton who also got another point for a correct challenge in the round. So he's equal in the lead with Clement Freud at the end of the round. Peter Jones, will you take the next round? The subject, the millennium. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Well, there's a difference of opinion about when it actually takes place, whether it's in 1999 or 2000. And then, of course, I was talking to someone just before the show started about this, and the Albert Hall, apparently, has been booked about 65 times by a similar number of people for one of these nights, or in fact, both of them, I believe. So they've got double figures there. We shall be doing just a minute, of course. It'll be the 30th episode, I think. The 30th series, rather, I should say. Uh, Paul Merton (laughs) Challenge. Repetition of 30th. Yes, it will be 30th. And you put, well, no, it won't be. It'll be the actually 34th series. Really? Yes. Are we doing two a year? (laughs) No, this is the 29th series. Is it? Yes. Good. So I thought it was the 30th series. No, it'll be the 33rd series, and we're just starting the 34th of the millennium. So make a note in your diaries now. Paul, I agree with your challenge. The audience couldn't care less about what I've just said. And uh, 28 seconds available for the millennium starting now. Well, as Peter says, some people will celebrate it in the year 2000, whereas, strictly speaking... Peter Jones' challenge. Repetition. He admitted it. He said, as Peter said, and then he said what I said. (laughs) Yes, but you, as we established... If you remember... You can't just repeat something the other person has said. That's right. Peter, Peter, when you were here a few weeks ago and Paul had exactly the same challenge on you, and I explained that you can repeat what somebody else has said in the round, but you cannot repeat what you've said yourself. You've obviously got a photographic memory. (laughs) I I, I can't remember being here, let alone what you said. Can you? I, I don't remember a word of it. No. I don't remember that at all, Nicholas. You you don't remember it? No. 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 Well, Well, it was weeks ago. How could you remember? (laughs) I have that kind of recall, Paul. Do you really? My God, it must be a terrible burden. (laughs) 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 What a heavy load you carry around. 
<laughs> so you can repeat what was said. So uh, I don't know who challenged who then. I think it was Peter challenged Paul, didn't he? Yeah. Right. So, Paul, you still have the subject. 23 seconds. The millennium starting now. Of course, it should be accurately reported that the millennium will happen in the year 2001. Stanley Kubrick made a wonderful film which was called that very thing. The title, of course, was a wonderful... <laughs> I'm not... <laughs> um, Clement Floyd challenge. Repetition of of course. Yes. Yes, right. Seven seconds available for the millennium with you, Clement, starting now. I believe the Albert Hall has been booked. <laughs> for... <laughs> Challenge. Hesitation. <laughs> yes, I know. He tried up. <laughs> Three seconds with you, Paul. The millennium starting now. Now, you may not notice, but you can actually book the Albert Hall for the year 2000. <laughs> so, Paul Merton once again was speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point, and he's in a strong lead ahead of Clement Freud. Graham Norton and Peter Jones have yet to, to make their mark, and Graham, it is your turn to begin. The subject, Jim. Will you tell us something about Jim in just a minute, starting now? Jim is an abbreviation of the word gymnasium, a place I love to go. The only problem is I do find it a bit confusing because there's so many machines and pieces of apparatus, perhaps it's apparati, I don't really know, but the piece of equipment I like the best is long and you need to pull down on it. It's called... The sunbed. Oh. <laughs> Clement, you challenge. Well, until he said sunbed, it was going to be deviation, but I. <laughs> <laughs> so you try to anticipate a challenge, which is very shrewd, but on this occasion you tripped yourself up. An incorrect challenge, Graham. So you keep the subject. And you have 33 seconds to continue on Jim starting now. Jim has just opened a shop underneath my flat. It was empty for a month. I can't tell you the worry. Because you can think someone will break in. They'll squat the thing. But happily, Jim has rented it now. And he's started a small business there. He doesn't stock very much. Generally, just pot noodle and old papers. <laughs> but still, it's something in the morning when you're feeling a bit peckish. And you think, ooh, what will I have? I'll go and ask Jim. And sure enough, Jim is there. And he's even said to me on more than one occasion, Graham, don't you worry, I'll order things in special. And I said, Jim, don't fuss. So Graham Norton started with the subject and in spite of an interruption in the middle, kept going with the subject. Gain that extra point for speaking as the whistle went and who turns it to begin. Um, oh, it's Clement. Clement, crosswords. Will you tell us something about crosswords in this game starting now? Damn, bum, drat, bother <laughs> are the sort of crosswords that spring to mind. There are also competitions in many newspapers, usually on the back page, in which you're given clues both down and across. And there are those, like my dear wife, who spend an awful lot of time solving the questions and giving the correct answers in exacting the right number of letters placed into the appropriate squares. And I admire that sort of knowledge hugely and am myself totally unable to comply with the instructions printed on the media paper which we purchase or is brought every day of the week. <laughs> also on Sundays, where crosswords are marvellously diverse and give prizes of considerable value to those who solve answers and questions exactly as they are placed. A Peter Jones challenge. We don't solve answers. <laughs> Do you? You <laughs> can't solve an answer. A very shrewd challenge, Peter, yes. And you very cleverly got in with only three seconds to go. <laughs> <laughs> so crosswords is with you, Peter, and there are three seconds starting now. John Gielgud is a great crossword player, and he... <laughs> so Peter Jones and Graham Norton are in third place, Clement Freud in second place behind our leader, Paul Merton. And Paul, once more, it is your turn to begin, and the subject is turning the other cheek. You have 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. 
I think this is a rather bad piece of advice, because if you turn the other cheek, good chance are you'll get the other one slapped just as hard as the first one was. I think it's a much better way to deal with life by saying, get your retaliation in first. This is the complete opposite of turning the other cheek, but those people who are so meek and mild where you hit them and they say, I don't care, look, I shall turn my face. I present the other side of my visards for you to strike also. And they hit them again and they, what can you do with these people? It's obviously a completely... Peter Jones challenge. Repetition of people. There were too many people yes. there, yes, turning their cheeks. All right. 30 yes. seconds available for you to tell us something about turning the other cheek, Peter, starting now. It does smack of masochism, in my opinion. <laughs> I think if you do that, then you deserve all you've got coming to you. <laughs> and it wouldn't be my advice to a child who was slapped in the face, or a grown up for that matter. Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> Just, I think. Uh, mm. um, uh, mm. Yes, I was just trying to think of something else to say, <laughs> just to uh, keep that dreary uh, monologue going. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough in just a minute. Fourteen seconds available. Turning the other cheek, Clement. Starting now. Turning the other cheek is the opposite instruction to do unto others and run like hell. <laughs> when Cynthia Payne stood for Parliament at a by-election. I suggest that she embraced as her motto. <laughs> Graham, you, you challenged. Well, I, I did for hesitation, but I'm dying to know what you told Cynthia. Mm. I know. Do you want to finish the round, then we might discover if what If you give said. me an extra point, I'll tell you what I... <laughs> Graham, one second. Turning the other cheek, starting now. Frank Cobb cheeks. Right. Come and see if you can earn that extra point. I did suggest that she used as her motto, if you can't join them, beat them. <laughs> we enjoyed it, Clement. There we are. You get your bonus. Uh, Peter Jones, your turn to begin. The big cheese. With you, Peter, starting now. Well, there are lots of very big cheeses. Gouda is one of them, made in a village in the Netherlands, and they make Edam as well in an adjacent place. Then, of course, there's Gruyere in Switzerland, which also comes from another town of the same name <laughs> as the cheese. But mostly, and what a boring subject this is, <laughs> uh, it is concerned with politicians uh, pressing the flesh. <laughs> And usually, they are, if they press enough flesh, they become a big cheese. <laughs> <clears throat> and they are uh, highly thought of individuals, or perhaps they are people who are terrified of them, I don't know, as it, with the mafia. A lot of them belong to it, no doubt. And what... <laughs> this, um... Clement Freud is challenged. Hesitation. Hesitation, yes, I would grab that one. The big cheese is with you, Clement. There are 11 seconds available, starting now. Signor Agnelli, who is the president of Fiat in Italy, once said, and he is a big cheese, if you wish to run a successful company, you need an uneven number of directors. And three is too many. Mm. Clement Freud speaking as the whistle went again, that extra point, and he has taken the lead ahead of Paul Merton at the end of that round. Graham Morton, it is your turn to begin. The subject is common. Will you tell us something about common in just a minute, starting now? Often common is seen as a sort of derogatory term, and how depressing it is in the winter when you get a bit of a headache and your nose is running and you're coughing and you go to the doctor looking for sympathy and all he can say is, you've got a common cold. <laughs> and you just think, well, what? Did I catch it from chips? And will people come to my bedside with plastic roses wrapped in tabloid newspapers? <laughs> this is horrific. Why can't they call it something else? Common, it's not a nice word, and I don't think it should be used. I think people in the medical... Uh, Clement Freud Challenge. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, think twice, repetition. Yes, uh, no. 23 seconds. The common, Clement, with you, starting now. Wandsworth Common and Clapham Common are the commons that I'm most fond of. But you will find commons in the counties of Suffolk and Norfolk, Cambridgeshire, Hereford, Hertfordshire, Buckinghamshire, 
A common I particularly enjoy is one in the county of Hereford. Beautiful. Yes. <laughs> Lush, oh, verdant. Hesitation. It was hesitation, because he, he said Hereford before. That's why. Hartford. It was waiting for the challenge and nobody came in. Hartford. But hesitation happened. Two seconds available. Common with you, Paul, starting Well, up. I agree with what everybody says about this subject, really. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Merton was speaking as Whistle when gained that extra point and he has moved forward, but he's still one point behind our leader, Clement Freud. Clement, it's your turn to begin a dog's dinner, <laughs> something that you would have never served in your restaurant, but will you talk about it? 60 seconds, starting now. It used to be very difficult for people who had dogs who wanted to go on holiday to ensure that the dog's dinner arrived while they were away in Benidorm or wherever, but a company has now invented something called a dog's dinner disposal unit machine into which you put a dozen or more sachets of whatever disgusting viands. Uh, Graham Norton challenge. I think this is a bit nonsense. Why would it be a dog dinner disposal machine? A dog is a dog dinner disposal machine. <laughs> So what is your challenge, then? Philosophy. It should, it should, it should, well, no, it should be dispenser, surely. Surely. It would dispense the dinner, not dispose of it. Uh, Graham, uh, alas, whether it dispenses or disposes, it doesn't matter. He wasn't actually technically deviating from the subject. And how the does the dog dinner. get it out of the sachet? No. Do you... <laughs> Of holes. He's making it up. I think every day a little door opens, the dog sees the sachet, the door closes, the next day the same thing happens again. <laughs> it's enough to send your dog round the twist, isn't it? <laughs> it's like, well, they, they used to torture people in prisons like that, in old spy films, aren't they? You, the, the thing comes round, there's your dinner, you go for it, then it closes, you can't get it. <laughs> In this age of dog eat dog, I would have thought a dog would be the best dinner for a dog. <laughs> Wouldn't it? <laughs> Graham, I can't agree with the challenge, as good as it was. Um, Clement, you still have the subject. 36 seconds are available. A dog's dinner starting now. A dog's dinner is also the expression used to describe unpalatable food which is put before persons, men, women, children, or any other species of humanity. <laughs> Sir Walter Scott, when he was in the South Arctic seas, before he escaped... Was Sir Walter Scott ever in the... <laughs> Sir Walter Scott wasn't. He was a novelist, wasn't he? <laughs> Sir Walter Scott in the South Seas and escaping. I mean, <laughs> the whole thing is getting so bizarre. It sounded like a Paul Merton flight of fantasy. You are right. It was quite devious. Uh, 17 seconds for a dog's dinner with you, Paul, starting now. The perfect thing for a dog's dinner is a big cheese. And when I say that, I refer to the Bee Gees, who actually had a hit with Saturday Night Fever in 1977. What a great band they were. I would willingly feed them to any animal, whether it be canine <laughs> or feline. I wouldn't care, particularly the one in the middle, Barry. I think any Alsatian <laughs> would be more than happy. <laughs> well, Paul Merton got points in that round, including one for speaking as the whistle went, and has moved forward. He's now one ahead of Clement Freud. Uh, Graham Norton and Peter Jones are equal in third place, a little way behind, and Paul, it is your turn to begin. Fudge. 60 seconds, starting now. If you want your dog to stop barking, give it fudge. <laughs> it won't be able to move its mouth, because the trouble with fudge is it's so sticky. I don't actually like this stuff. I've had it a couple of times when you have to go to some professional fudge day where celebrities have cooked fudge and you have to test which is the best fudge. Is it Melvin Hayes or has Wendy Craig won it for the third year running? <laughs> And you go along to these things. Derek Nimmo, in fact, came fourth one year with a remarkable fudge, which um, turned out to be some knee nicked from Nicholas Parsons. And it was a great, <laughs> terrible scene as the two of them had a massive fight in the beer tent. Bottles of tyres are being smashed all over the place. <laughs> Nicholas, I remember, was absolutely steaming. Uh, Clement Freud challenged you. Two Nicholases. Two yeah. Nicholas. I know, what a pity. Oh. oh, they feel they can't have too much of Nicholas. But they're not. <laughs> they're not. Oh. That's three people playing. clapped there. I know. Three out of 300. I know. <laughs> it's outrageous. And two of them were being bullied by the other one. 
Clement, he did repeat Nicholas, and there are 21 seconds available for you to tell us something about fudge starting now. Quite apart from the sweetmeat fudge, fudge typographically is what used to be called stop press, a page which had a little square on it which could be replaced by further news without resetting the whole newspaper. And fudging was something editors were very keen on. Well, it is nip and tuck, as they say, because Clement Freud has now won ahead of Paul Merton. And Peter Jones, it's your turn to begin. The subject is saloons. Will you tell us something about saloons in just a minute, starting now? Well, they're a cut above the public bars rule, and I've known a number of pleasant uh, saloons. Most of them have been modernised, and they're not nearly as nice as they were before that. But I'm not a great pub goer, so I'm not really very qualified to speak on the subject of uh, saloons for any length of time, not even a minute. But (laughs) uh, Clement Freud would tell you that he knows saloons in Hertfordshire, Herefordshire, (laughs) Devonshire, Cornwall, Northumberland and elsewhere. And I'm sure he does, and very nice they are. They sell crisps and wine in automatic dispensers, or disposals, as possible. <laughs> uh, I don't know. But the actual beverage isn't very nice. Uh, uh, when it comes out of these uh, containers, uh, we'll call them, and uh, the water and the beer is, uh, t- generally tends to be... Uh, <laughs> Well, that hasn't happened for quite a long time. Someone began with the subject and finished with the subject. Two points to Peter Jones. Uh, Graham Norton, it is your turn to begin. The subject, bucket shops. Will you tell us something about those? I'm sure it falls into your area of knowledge. 60 seconds starting now. Bucket shops, once a thriving industry, have never really recovered from the blow dealt to them by the introduction of indoor plumbing. There was a time when every high street in the land had a bucket shop. There were chains of them. Buckets are us. House of buckets. World of buckets. Over the richer people. Um, um, Paul Merton challenge. Well, this could go either way, but repetition of buckets, because it's bucket on the card. I know. Isn't that mean? It's bucket on the card, and you were doing this. Paul, I, I said go. I know. <laughs> I've, I've known this a decision to go one way, then the other, <laughs> then back again. No, no. I think he secretly tosses a coin in his pocket. <laughs> He's doing something That's up there. That's quite anyway. a trick. <laughs> oh, looks like heads from where I'm sitting. <laughs> How low can you take it? Well, oh. I don't know. You tell us, Nicholas. <laughs> 10p piece, I heard. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, well. I'm glad they laugh. It shows I'm a good sport. <laughs> but you did repeat buckets, so I've got to be fair in just a minute. Uh, Paul, a correct challenge, 36 <laughs> seconds. Will you tell us something about bucket shops starting now? Well, I don't know enough about them, really, so I think you should give the subject back to Graham. Um... <laughs> Clement Freud challenge. Hesitation. Yes, there was hesitation. (laughs) Clement, 32 seconds on Bucket Shops starting now. Bucket Shops is the name given to travel agents who are not bound by some altruistic charter and therefore they can sell flights which don't necessarily exist. (laughs) What is so miserable about Bucket Shops is that you sit on a plane and you have no idea whether the person sitting next to you... I've said sitting twice now, but I was saying... <laughs> Peter, your mic came on. A repetition sorry. of sitting. Yes, that's right. Well done, Peter. Right. <laughs> 13 seconds. Bucket shop starting now. You can get them at Ironmongers. And I once had an Italian... <laughs> Clement Freud Charity. Deviation. You what? can't get you a can't bucket shop at Ironmongers. You can't buy a bucket shop. <laughs> buckets. You get buckets. Whittled it down to buckets. Mm. Oh, I see. You mean a bucket shop is a shop that sells buckets. Right. So that was an incorrect challenge. And you have a point for that. (laughs) 
and there are nine seconds for you to continue on bucket shops starting now. I once heard an Italian describe it as an iron mangiare shop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you couldn't describe it because it's bucket shops. <laughs> no, he had interpreted the subject, as I understood it, to, uh, to shops that sell buckets. So, um... There are five seconds for you to continue on bucket shops, Peter, starting now. Well, I don't know any shop that sells buckets is a bucket shop, as far as I'm concerned. (laughs) Then he should stop talking about it. (laughs) So so the only thing I can do is to give the benefit of the doubt to Peter Jones Uh and say you have half a second on bucket shops starting now, Peter. Yes. So Peter came from nowhere in that round and gained a number Went of points. Went back there afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Graham Norton's in fourth place, then Peter Jones. Paul Merton is behind our leader, Clement Freud, only one point behind him. I mention that fact because we are now entering the last round of the show and it is Clement Freud to begin and the subject is Making Waves, starting now. It seems to me that the subject of Making Waves when you are one point ahead in just a minute is not one which is conducive to winning a game because it is simply too difficult to explain the manufacture of oscillation on the water (laughs) in the number of seconds which I will have to spin out my monologue in order to explain this to the good people sitting here in this theatre waiting for me to stumble or fall. Get into a bathtub and move your hand backwards and forwards, and you'll be surprised how many waves will appear on the surface of the water, <coughs> causing uh, great... Paul Merton challenge. Repetition of surface. Yes. Really? Oh. <laughs> yes, yes. I think really. someone's in love with you out there, can you? <laughs> No, he, he did repeat that. Um, so, Paul, you have the subject of making waves... And there are 22 seconds left starting now. Wave-making machines have become very popular in swimming pools up and down the country. Local town councils have got involved in, invested in these particular apparatus, and they are very popular with people. You... Graham Norton challenge. Was there a popular? A uh, popular? Yes, two populars mm. there. Uh, mm. Eight seconds for you, Graham, on making waves starting now. Making waves is something that David Copperfield, the magician's hairdresser, seems to do over time, <laughs> I feel. In the mistaken... <laughs> and so Graham Norton aptly brought this show to a close, gained an extra point for doing so. It remains for me to give you the final score. Graham Norton did magnificently. He contributes so much. But he doesn't make many points. I don't know why. (laughs) But it is the contribution, which we love, Graham. Uh, Peter Jones, I can say the same thing about him. He's been doing it, making an amazing contribution for a large number of years. But he's he's got quite a few points. He's got quite a few points. But a great contribution came from the other two players of the game. And very aptly, they both finished up with an equal number of points. So a very apt situation to say, Paul Merton and Clement Freud, you tie to be called the winners this week. It only remains for me to say thank you to our four outstanding players of the game. Also, I must thank Elaine Wigley for keeping the score so well, blowing her whistle so delicately, our producer Anne Jobson, Ian Messeter for thinking of the game, and also from me, Nicholas Parsons. We do hope you've enjoyed it. Be at the end of your radio sets the next time we take to the air to play just a minute. Till then, from all of us here, goodbye! My name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my pleasure not only to welcome our listeners, but also the four exciting and diverse personalities who this week are going to play just a minute. We welcome two outstanding young comedians of today, one of them who has played the game many times before, that is Paul Merton, and another outstanding comedian who has never played the game before, but we are equally delighted to have him here, and that is Julian Carey. We also welcome back two of the oldest players of the game. They've been playing it as long as I have. That is Derek Nimmo and Clement Freud, and would you please welcome all four of them. Hi. 
I'm very fortunate where I sit because I have beside me the lovely Elaine Wigley, who has a stopwatch in one hand, which lets me know how many seconds have passed after each challenge, and also she blows a whistle when 60 seconds have passed. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Jersey Arts Centre in St. Helier, the capital of this lovely Channel Island, and we are facing a highly motivated and exciting <laughs> Jersey audience. And as usual, I'm going to ask our four players of the game to speak, if they can, on the subject I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviation. And the first person to begin is Clement Freud. Clement, the first subject is Jersey. So would you talk about Jersey for just a minute, if you can, starting now? Jersey is the name of a pullover which comes from the eponymous island, the largest of the group of Channel Isles. It is a place from which people don't come as much as go <laughs> I mean particularly Alan Wicker and Fanny Craddock, as opposed to Mrs. Langtree and Matt Letissier. To socially aware people, the name Child Villiers, who has Austin uh, House Derek in... Nimmer has challenged. Deviation gun, sir. Yes, I would agree. You gave fire, Jersey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> On I the would... shuttle. Um, <laughs> it's the first time, actually, we've ever had an audience in just a minute boo. <laughs> <laughs> so it's obviously going to be a very exciting show. Uh, Derek, I agree with your challenge, which means you get a point for a correct challenge, and you take over the subject of Jersey. There are 29 seconds left, and you start now. One of the things I'd really like about Jersey is this um, magnificent Julie zoo. Julie challenge. Oh, I'm sorry. Didn't you sort of fumble into your words? <laughs> You're right. You're absolutely right. Well done. I don't know. Julian, well, listen, the first time we've heard from you ever on Just a Minute, and uh, he fumbled, we call that hesitation. You... <laughs> anyway, Julian, there are 26 seconds left. The subject is Jersey, and you begin now. There are several things I like about Jersey, and first of all, I should mention St. Peter's Bunker. <laughs> it's very, very snug indeed. And then I must move on to your mouth-watering cucumbers. <laughs> And then, of course, there's plums, which are not only juicy, but full of flavour. Jersey is an ideal spot to attend if you like rich people. <laughs> that whistle tells us that the 60 seconds are up, and whoever is speaking at that moment gets an extra point. On this occasion, it was Julian Clary. Uh, Paul Merton, will you take the next round? The subject, wrestling. Will you tell us something about that in this game? <laughs> Starting now. Every Saturday afternoon on ITV, I used to watch wrestling. That used to be broadcast from various parts of the mainland, Wolverhampton Town Hall or somewhere in Ipswich. And I particularly enjoyed wrestlers such as Burt Royal and Vic Faulkner. And the great thing about British wrestling is it's so obviously faked. I remember one particular practitioner of the art, a, a wrestler called Jim Brakes, who actually fell out of the ring because somebody threw a towel at him. <laughs> and this is burnt in my memory. He was a bit of a hard man, and he was having an argument with the referee, and his opponent threw a towel, which is... Uh, Derek Nimmer challenge. Repetition of playing about. Yes, um, he threw the towel in um, there, and so that is a repetition. He did keep going for um, 37 seconds, which was very good, and 23 remain for you, Derek, to take over the subject of wrestling starting now. I wrestle with my conscience every time Muhammad <laughs> Saeed offers me a free holiday at the Ritz and Paris. <laughs> I say to myself, but Al, as he likes to be called, is so persuasive. Sometimes he sends me food hampers from his emporium called Harrods, which I gratefully receive, but there is no catch to it. I will not ask questions at equity meetings just to please him. Julian Clary, uh, would you like to take the next round? The subject is Bergerac. Very <laughs> A very apt subject. Obviously, some people in the audience didn't enjoy it from their end. <laughs> but uh, would you talk on Bergerac? 60 seconds starting now. Oh, Bergerac. It's a television detective series. Some would call it a defective series. <laughs> Starring. Who did that? Uh, keep going. Starring. Oh, I'm sorry, Camelot has buzzed. 
it was a reputation of serious. Uh, and I'm not going to give it to you again, because we want to hear from you, and you've only just got going, and there are 52 seconds left, but we don't score any points on that one. It's still with you, Bergerac, starting now. So uh, popular. Paul Merton Challenge. Repetition of series. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I didn't give it against him the last time, I can't give it against him this time, so this time you've got a point for an incorrect challenge. So uh, you keep going with 50 seconds <laughs> on it. Bergerac starting now. So popular was Bergerac. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Miller. Repetition of popular. I know, you said popular before as well. well I just got this is recapping where yeah, I... No, no, you see, Julian... That's called repetition, if you recap. Yeah, <laughs> if you realise that. Well, you can repeat things from other rounds, but you can't repeat words you said in this round. As I've given... A, oh, shut up for a minute. <laughs> I've given it against all three of them now. It's only fair that you gain a point at each one of their expense. But from now on, I've got to be a bit more firm about it. So carry on, Julian. Bergerac. <laughs> 48 seconds, starting now. John Nettles is a bit of a gay icon. In fact, <laughs> Clement Floyd challenge. Deviation. Why? <laughs> Do you disagree? He said neither popular nor serious. <laughs> Oh, a very subtle, clever challenge. I thought we were challenging on the icon. Um, and that was a definitely an incorrect challenge, Clement, but it was very entertaining. And um, 44 seconds or less for Bergerac. Still with you, Julian, uh, starting now. He has Bergerac bed linen and a Bergerac soap on a rope. His whole life is one long detention. <laughs> uh, Yes, hesitation. hesitation. It is a difficult game, isn't it? Um, uh, 35 seconds, Derek. A point to you. You take over the subject, starting... Surrounded de Bergerac had an extraordinary long nose, and because of this, he claimed he fought over a thousand duels during his lifetime. The town of Bergerac is situated on the north bank of the Lodoyne and has a statue to the famous swordsman right in the middle of the village. It is absolutely magnificent. The wine from that region, which is Cabernet mm. Merlin... Clement Freud. Deviation in Bergerac is a town. Yes. I couldn't say town twice. Really? I know you, you could, could work, but, but you I had fine. said town twice. I know. You're about to re that would have been a repetition. That would have been repetition. <laughs> Well, he's charged for deviation, and that is a correct deviation. That's why the game is so difficult to play. Can Nick. I suggest we pick another word? <laughs> Clement, do you want to let him have it, then? He's determined not to let go on it. Fifteen seconds, Derek. Bergerac, starting now. I like drinking this splendid brew. It's also near to a very particular white... Uh, Paul Challenge. Is, is wine, strictly speaking, a brew? <laughs> No, I think beer you brew, brewed, you brewed beer, you, you brew, brew beer, and uh, I don't... Fermented. No, no, I think wine has... Yeah, you ferment wine. You ferment wine. You can and call you any liquid a brew, can't you? Well, yes. Oh, you we're going to have another stupid argument. <laughs> you, can, you, can I... call, you can call cats urine a brew. You, yes, yes. <laughs> but it doesn't mean I'll come round to your house for drinks. <laughs> <laughs> you can call any liquid a brew. Come on, Eight seconds for you, Paul, on Bergerac, starting now. Well, it's a very popular detective series. It's been going for about eight or nine years now. It stars John Nettles, and all the incidents that he investigates happen... Derek Nimmo, Trump. Nothing going on. It's finished. <laughs> it's, it's currently being repeated on UK Gold. <laughs> He's right, I'm afraid. One second with you, Paul. Bergerac, starting now. How many seconds have I got? One. Oh. Yes, one. Then around, Paul Merton speaking as the whistle went, got an extra point. He is in third place, one point behind Julian Clary, who is in second place behind our leader, who is still Derek and Nimmo. Clement, your turn to begin the subject, sour grapes. Will you tell us something about that subject? <laughs> <laughs> and don't start talking about brewing, for God's sake. <laughs> uh, starting now. Sour grapes are grapes which are not sweet. Or, to put it another way, grapes which are sour or lack a certain... Sugar content. <laughs> challenge. Hesitation. Yes, indeed, indeed. Sour grapes with you, Paul. Fifty seconds are left, starting now. I was round Derek Nimmo's house the other night, drinking this rather delicious, marvellous cocktail, and I suddenly thought all oh, these grapes were a bit sour. And he said, "No, it's not grapes. It's actually cat's piss." I just put it in the... <laughs> 
he said, because basically any liquid is a brew. And of course, I was forced to agree with him. I once bought a beer. Don't never challenge. Deviation. I wouldn't have him in the house. <laughs> but, um, interestingly, he doesn't deny that he serves cat's piss. <laughs> What I like to do on these occasions is I give a bonus point to Derek Nimmo for his challenge because the audience enjoyed it so much. But Paul gets a point for being interrupted and he keeps the subject and there are 32 seconds left for sour grapes starting now. Of course it can also refer to that feeling you have when somebody that perhaps you've been a rival for in a job has somehow got ahead of you, has gained that promotion and you think, why has this individual risen above the corporate ladder higher than I? Why, I'm as talented as that person. I've got a certificate for swimming 25 yards breaststroke. <laughs> Can this other claimant lay such a claim? No, they can't. Uh, claim of Freud. Repetition of person. I let him go on for a bit. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did repeat person. I'm did sorry. I really? Yes. And Clement's got in with five seconds on oh, Sour Oh, five seconds, is it? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> It's a subtle way of playing the game if you've got the courage to see it through. A gambling man can do that, Mike Clement. Five seconds, starting now. Sour grapes, philologically, is whinging, whining, not taking your just desserts. So, Paul Merton, at the end of that round, is in second place. He's just behind our leader, Derek Nimmo. He's followed one point behind him is Julian Clary, and then Clement Freud in fourth place for once. And, Paul, your turn to begin a small holding. <laughs> 60 seconds as usual, starting now. I own some land here in Jersey. It's actually quite a tiny piece. It's the size of a tennis shoe, and I intend to build very tall but thin buildings on it. <laughs> To the sky. The skyscrapers, of course, are very... Julian Clary. Did you repeat sky? Well, he said skyscraper. I don't know if it's one word or not. Skyscraper's hyphenated. If you want to be kind to your friend Julian and say, all right, it was hyphenated, he can mm. have it. All right. Yeah, yeah. It's hyphenated, I think. Hyphenated, so, right, there we are. Wasn't that generous of him? Is he uh, being Paul? kind? He's yeah. being... Yes. Yeah. So a small holding is with you, Julian Clary, and 46 seconds are left starting now. <laughs> Small and, uh, Paul Merton Charles. Hesitation. <laughs> <laughs> He's being very kind to you, isn't he? Another point to Julian Clary and a small holding still with him and 46 seconds left starting now. You could grow rhubarb on a small holding and sometimes you could go down in the afternoon, look under the rhubarb leaf. And there no more challenge. Two rhubarb. Oh, yes. Yes, you had too rhubarb, much rhubarb. <laughs> you had too much rhubarb on your small holding at the <laughs> Uh, Derek, a correct challenge. 38 seconds left, a small holding, starting now. The first small holding I bought, I drove from Alice Springs to Broken Hill. It was yellow and had a very good engine with a rather curious gearbox. I don't know why holdings have gone out of popularity. They used to sell a great deal in Malaysia and all through the Far East. But these days, they seem to move on to Fords and Toyotas, like so much of the world. But Holden was a particularly good motor car, and I had a great affection for it, and it was very difficult for me. But finally, because I was leaving the Antipodes, I had to sell it. And I was immensely sorry. I read the Well, very... Nemo kept going magnificently there until the whistle went, so he's increased his lead at the end of the round. And uh, whose turn is it next? Oh, Derek, it's also your turn to begin. The subject, my favourite flowers. 60 seconds, starting now. My favourite flowers are the family flowers that live in Bristol. And my son, Piers James Alexander, last May, married Marina Flowers. You may well have seen pictures in Hello. And it really was the most marvellous wedding. And they have, the head of the family, actually, is called Mikey. <laughs> and he's an awfully jolly flowers, really. And his <laughs> wife is called Jean. And they have a daughter of extreme beauty called Louise, who is now uh, my daughter. Paul Challenge. Three called. Three called, yes. Yes, all right. Mm, that's right. Paul. Right. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought it was hyphenated, actually. <laughs> <laughs> 32 seconds, my favourite flowers, starting now. I don't really have any favourite flowers. Pen and Freud, son. Better shut up. And... <laughs> Going, that's the applauding, Sergeant Aaron, aggression. 
But as they enjoyed it, Clement, I give you a bonus point for your timing. And uh, But as Paul was interrupted, he also gets a point. He keeps the subject, 29 seconds. My favourite flowers starting now. But if I had to pick one, it would undoubtedly be the chrysanthemum. What a wonderful flower that is. There was somebody here in the front row who murmured agreement, as I mentioned that... Julian Clary challenge. That was me who murmured. <laughs> So, you mean that was deviation because it wasn't from the front row, it was from over here? That's what I mean. I see it's a free-for-all. Well, I'll have to take your word for it, Julian. If that is true, there were no murmurs from the front row, but Julian uh, murmured agreement. So, deviation. 19 seconds, uh, Julian, my favourite flowers. <laughs> well, uh, that is logical. If the murmur Nicholas, didn't come from there, but logical it came from here. in your life. <laughs> No, but when I have a new player on the game, I try to use I illogical logicality. Let's uh, press on. Uh, Julian, you have the subject of my favourite flowers starting now. My favourite flowers are Mesembrianthems, although don't ask me to spell it. I like them because they open up when the sun comes out. They expand like that. Their petals shaking in the sunlight, and then if the... Very kind. Oh, I know, it's yeah. a tough game, Julian. And he's got him with six seconds to go on my favourite flowers, Derek, starting now. I have a most magnificent Rosa Banks here, which is now 35 feet high and expanding all directions. Well, at the end of that round, Colonel Floyd is training a little, but Paul Merton and Julian Clary are equal in second place, but quite a few points behind our leader, who is still Derek Nimmo. And Julian, your turn to begin. The subject, Bob's your uncle. Will you tell us something about Bob's your uncle in just a minute, starting now? Bob's your uncle has several meanings. It means there we have it, or done and dusted, words like that. It also means Bob is your uncle, as is the case for me. My uncle Bob lived on the island... Derek Nimmer challenge. It's, the subject is your uncle, not my uncle. It doesn't matter. Because it, it, Bob's your uncle, not Bob's <laughs> uncle. If we had to talk about Bob's my uncle, that'd but, be on the but, car. But he can still talk about his uncle Bob as opposed to Bob's your uncle. Deviation. Well, if the subject was Bob's Fred's uncle, could he still talk about his uncle Bob? <laughs> You are very obstreperous on occasion, Jerry. <laughs> no, he hadn't got it going enough to cause deviation. So, Julian, 44 seconds left. Bob's your uncle, starting now. Trying to open your mouth sometimes. <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. My uncle, Bob, lived on the Isle of Wight, and he used to have a band called Uncle Bob's... <laughs> I think that was... I think that definitely having was, a yes. nervous Clement. breakdown now. Yeah. <laughs> Clement, the subject, 33 seconds. Bob's your uncle starting now. If I had an Uncle Bob, I would send him to Jersey for tax purposes, <laughs> and I would get him to farm a crop of potatoes. There is nothing more wonderful than those tubers that come from the <laughs> island. Uh. Paul, challenge on the music. Well, I, I hesitate to get on the wrong side of the audience, but I, 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 I disagree with a the statement there is nothing more wonderful than Jersey potatoes. Yeah. Excuse me, are you aware of the Euro Tunnel? <laughs> Man has landed on the moon. We are, we are sending satellites to Uranus. <laughs> but no, you'd get rid of all that as long as you had a bag of spuds, wouldn't you? <laughs> Paul, because you're your outrageous comedy performance, we will give you a bonus point. Right, um, Clement, you have another point for being an uh, incorrect challenge. And 18 seconds are left for... Uh, it's still Bob's your uncle, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's well, Bob's your uncle starting now. If Bob's your uncle and wants to eat the delicious, waxy, yellow things that come from the earth on the outskirts of St. Clement's, Steam them, a little butter, parsley, and... Julian, you challenge. Um, a deviation. Yeah, deviation. It's, it's, it's horrible. He's deviation. away from Bob's your uncle. He's on our potatoes, isn't he? Yes. Well done. You spotted that. <laughs> and you got in very cleverly. You're getting good at this game. One second to go. And the subject is still Bob's your uncle starting now. If I get to the end of... <laughs> 
so the contest is getting uh, tighter and more fraught. <laughs> Clement Freud is creeping up on Paul Merton, which is rather sinister, seeing he's sitting beside him. And um, Paul's just behind Julian Clary, a first time player of the game. He's only two points behind our leader, who's still Derek Nimmo. Clement, your turn to begin. The subject, flattery. Will you tell us something about that subject in this game starting now? On a recent birthday, Mr. Bill Coburn, who was then chairman of Royal Mail, was kind enough to give me a penny black stamp. And I said to him, Philatony will get you nowhere. <laughs> it is not the only nice thing that I've said. I have come here and made the most outrageously uh, nice uh, remarks. Very uh, Nimmo challenge. Ah, uh, his bit. He did hesitate before he said about the outrageously nice. Right, 38 seconds. Derek, with you. Uh, flattery, starting now. Flattery is what people say to your face. They wouldn't say behind your back. There are two kinds of people that uh, like flattery. Clement Floyd challenge. Two people. 29 seconds. Clement, flattery is back with you, starting now. If there's any one thing more appealing than Nicholas Parsons' brain, it is Derek Nemo's beauty. <laughs> Julian Clary, in his own way, has an elegant, sophisticated delightfulness, matched, I think, by Paul Merton. Paul Merton challenge. What rubbish. <laughs> So, but are you not allowed to speak rubbish in just a minute, as you do? Deviation. I, have not, I haven't got a scrap of elegance in my whole body. <laughs> we haven't quite got to what you had, actually. <laughs> uh, so I disagree with the challenge. Ten seconds still with Clement on flattery, starting now. As I was saying, flattery is saying things about people which you don't really mean. In <laughs> fact, we all uh, know. Paul has challenged again. Two sayings. As I was saying, yes, flattery saying. Saying. Well, listen, Paul, four seconds are left. Flattery with you, starting now. I wouldn't take gold. Give me Jersey potatoes every time. <laughs> We've got about one more round to go. What is the situation? Clement Freud is now moving forward, but he's two points behind Paul Merton and June Carrier, who are equal in second place. Teddy Nimmo's just ahead in the lead, and Paul, your turn to begin. Badgers. Tell us something about those attractive little animals in this game starting now. It's a strange creature. It's the only animal that's mastered the art of the penny whistle. And if you go down to the woods late at night, you can hear the badgers whistling popular show tunes or perhaps an extract of some Mahler symphony, and they can't get enough of it. And people who don't live in the countryside say, oh, what nonsense, the badgers can't play musical instruments. And you say, ah... Oh, follow me and you take them down to a little set where there might be a couple of these delightful creatures and a drummer just in the corner <laughs> and they've got the violin under their arm and they're playing the most gorgeous romantic gypsy music of course the badger Terry Nemo right. just a music I'm sad I know we were enjoying that <laughs> Derek, you've got him with 22 seconds on Badger starting now. When I was a senior sixer in the Wolf Cubs, I had a lot of Badgers. I got them mainly for good work like tree climbing, looking at uh, small people in the woods playing musical instruments. What's the matter with you? How long have you got? Um, I think it was deviation. <laughs> Deviation is misunderstood the word. Yes, that's right. I know he often does. The, um, it is true. He, we're talking about badgers and not badges. Mm. And uh, they are subtly different. Uh, <laughs> in <laughs> pronunciation, but utterly different in you concept. You couldn't have badges playing musical instruments. That'd be ridiculous. <laughs> If you believe in the fairies, you can do what you did, Paul. <laughs> Twelve seconds for you, Julian, on Badger, starting now. My favourite programme is on BBC One. <laughs> Derek Nimmer Challenge. Repetition of B. BBC. <laughs> oh. it's, it's a correct challenge, but what do I do? Because I'd like Julian to finish the show. Um, <laughs> uh, though it's a correct challenge, well done, Derek. Give him a point, then. And... Uh, <laughs> Julian, finish the show for us because there are eight seconds. Carry on on Badgers starting now. Badger and Badger. Clement Floyd challenge. I don't want him to finish the show. <laughs> so you were challenged and it was an incorrect challenge. <laughs> so you have another point and you have seven seconds on Badgers, Julian, starting now. 4.15 most weekday <laughs> afternoon. Uh, Paul Merton challenge. I'd quite like to finish the show. <laughs> 
<laughs> so what I is mean, your... Well, well I mean, your... you just don't... You know, we should talk about it. <laughs> What is your challenge, then? I don't see why you um, just pick and say, Julian, you can finish the show. What about no, the rest I, I, of us I here? I twisted a challenge so that he could finish, so I agree, but then Clement played the game as well and gave him another point. And uh, what do you think I'm doing? You're... <laughs> I thought, actually, we were trying to get the subject so you could finish the That's show. That's right. So, so what is your challenge? Give I him the want Julian to continue. I, I so that's not a legitimate challenge? Yes, it is. <laughs> I've decided to say the opposite of everything that you say, and we can keep this going for about an hour. <laughs> and that will make it... We could just do one round like that. No, we, we can't. <laughs> I'm glad this is the last round, otherwise the whole show would grind to a halt, wouldn't it? No. <laughs> ah, you agree with me there. Uh, it wouldn't grind to a halt. So, there are five seconds left for you, Julian, on Badger, starting now. Quite happy to finish simultaneously, which is... Uh, <laughs> Derek Nimmel. He's not talking about Badgers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Derek, the correct challenge. Two seconds, Badger, starting now. Win the Willows is a very good play with Badgers. <laughs> As I indicated, that was to be the last round. Let me give you the final situation. And um, first of all, let me say right away that it's the contribution that counts and not the points. But if for those who are interested in points, for once Clement Freud finished in fourth place, surprisingly, behind Paul Merton, who was also surprisingly in third place, our first time player of the game, not surprisingly, in view of um, all that's taking place here, <laughs> he finished in second place. But just. So his contribution was golden, but the man with the most points, three ahead of Julian, was Derek Nemo. So we say, he's the winner this week. <laughs> so it, it only remains for me to thank our four outstanding players of the game for the marvellous contribution they make to the fun and the entertainment. I must also thank Elaine Wigley for so charmingly keeping the score and the stopwatch so I knew how many seconds were ticking away. Uh, Ian Messeter for having created the game, for which we're deeply grateful, Ian. And also Anne Jobson, who organises and produces the show. From all of them and from me, Nicholas Parsons, and our audience here in St. Helier in Jersey, thank you for attending. Thank the listeners for tuning in. Be with us the next time we take to the air to play just a minute. Until then, from all of us here, goodbye! <laughs> My name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my pleasure not only to welcome our listeners to the show, but to introduce the four unusual and diverse talents who this week are going to play just a minute. We welcome back two of the original players of the game, original in every sense of the word, that is Clement Freud and Peter Jones. We also welcome two other originals, in every other sense of the word, of a different generation who have not played the game so often, and that is Tony Hawks and Fred McCauley, and would you please welcome all all four of them! <laughs> this, uh, this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Students' Union in the ancient Scottish University of St. Andrews, not far from the golf course. on the picturesque east coast of Fife. <laughs> we are facing a very animated, excited, hyped up, <laughs> indebted and no doubt in debt student audience. 
as usual, I'm going to ask the four players of the game if they will speak on the subject that I will give them, and they're going to try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviation. Beside me sits Elaine Wigley, who will keep the score. She'll also blow a whistle when 60 seconds are up. And we're going to begin the show this week with Clement Freud, and the subject is quite proper and typical St. Andrews. So, Clement, will you tell us something about St. Andrews in this game of just a minute, starting now? St. Andrews is a town near Lucas, which has the railway station, <laughs> a cherished place run by Great Eastern Region Railways, I think. And we are sitting in the Students' Union, and I saw a notice which said, the free bus no longer runs on Saturdays. <laughs> I find it distressing that such a negative notice should be held up and posted on the bar. It's like saying sausages will be served without tomato ketchup. <laughs> As if somebody might suggest... Peter Jones, you challenged. Uh, hesitation. Yes, I think there was definite hesitation there, yes. <laughs> Listen, are you going to be partisan from the word go like that? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, there was definite hesitation. There was certain deviation. So, Peter, you have a correct challenge. You get a point for that, of course. And you have 21 seconds to take over the subject of St. Andrews starting now. Well, St. Andrew was the patron saint of Russia. <laughs> <laughs> And probably um, still is. Clement Freud challenge. Hesitation. Yes, we're definitely hesitating. Quite right. <laughs> Clement, you have a correct challenge. You've got the subject back again. 14 seconds available. St. Andrews starting now. Looking out of the window of my hotel bathroom, I saw the 18th hole of St. Andrews golf course. Fred McCauley challenge. Can I just ask why you've not got frosted glass in your bathroom window? <laughs> Obviously, Clement Freud especially asked for yeah. bathrooms without frosted glass. I, I, I was actually looking in. <laughs> that was the point I He had the better view, let me tell you. Know, more. <laughs> so, within the rules of just a minute, Fred, uh, what was your challenge, do you think? Uh, I, I have no reasonable challenge. You have no reasonable challenge. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'll do, Fred. You've only played the game twice before. I will give you a bonus point because we enjoyed the challenge so much. Thank you very much. But Clement Roy was interrupted, so he keeps the subject. It's a point for that. He has six seconds to continue on St. Andrews, starting now. Peter Jones believes that St. Andrew was the patron saint of Russia, and he is absolutely... <laughs> Whoever is speaking as the whistle goes gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Clement Freud, and naturally he's in the lead at the end of that round. Uh, but Tony Hawkes, would you take the next round? The subject is chatting up. I'm sure the student body here would like to hear from an experienced man like you on that subject, so regale us for just a minute, if you can, starting now. I'll tell you someone who must be an expert in the field of chatting up, and that is the assistant to a window cleaner who has to stand at the bottom of the ladder holding it steady because all day he is chatting up. Now, I was... It is no surprise to me that I have been asked to talk on this subject. Obviously, my reputation as something of a latter-day Casanova goes before me. And there is an expression, there are three ways to tell if a man is a good lover. The first is a poor memory, and, you know, I've completely forgotten what the other two are. My <coughs> favourite method of chatting up is to go up to a young lady at a party and say, excuse me, but do you know what the capital of Poland is? Mm. Fred McCauley challenge. Uh, deviation, because uh, I, Tony Hawks doesn't say that to young ladies at parties. He's asked me that before. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it was obviously a very, very good drink at that party. <laughs> you can chat somebody up of your own sex. You want to get into conversation? You might want to get a Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. Uh, no, Tony... <laughs> Uh, a, a very good attempt, Fred. I'm sorry, I disagree with the challenge, so Tony gets a point for that. He keeps the subject chatting up. Thirteen seconds are still available, starting now. And they, like Fred was, will be enchanted by this simple question. Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Repetition of question. Yes, because you asked the question before. So, repetition of questions, seven seconds still available, and it's chatting up with you now, Clement, starting now. Does your mother take in washing? Has she sold her mangle? What's become of the old piano your sister used to strangle? Has your father plenty of work? Clement <laughs> Freud! 
It was again speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point for doing so, has increased his lead, and the other three are equal in second place. Peter Jones, your turn to begin. The subject, a good dodge. Can you tell us something about a good dodge in just a minute, starting now? Well, my father-in-law was American. He used to have a very good dodge, which he drove around all over Los Angeles. <laughs> and it had big wings at the side and was a gas guzzler, of course. It used an enormous amount of petrol and went very fast. And the springing was quite unlike the European cars of that time or even the ones from the Far East, which hardly existed, of course, at the period that I'm speaking of. Now, this dodge, which he had no name for it, it had kind of things like portholes at the side of the bonnet, which were just purely decorative, if uh, I think. I don't think they served any useful purpose. But one went for long trips right through uh, Arizona, and we actually went to as far as Reno on one occasion, which was a delightful experience and would not have been the same had we been in any other make of car because the springing added to the general excitement and then when we arrived what the matter what, what time is it <laughs> well okay. peter you not kept you only kept going for 60 seconds you went on for 70 seconds actually really yes well, amazing. Peter, Peter, you, Peter when you said what time is it, I think it was about 1939, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. So you not only get a point right. for speaking as a whistle and Peter, but you also, in this game, get a bonus point for not being interrupted throughout the 60 seconds. So, Fred, your turn to begin the subject, a boogie. Well, you can take that many different ways, you know. Anyway, um, you have 60 seconds as usual, starting now. Well, as you've said, Nicholas, there are many ways that you can interpret the word bogey. I think I'll discuss, first of all, the golfing term, which is when you see a player on the fairway, maybe hoping to get on the green with his iron shot, he'll fire it through, and the club flies into the rough, all because he's had a bogey on the end of his fingers, <laughs> which affects your grip. The other type of bogey in Scotland is the trailer that people put on the back of their tractors for carrying many kinds of things around the countryside, turnips maybe, potatoes, lots of other kinds of vegetables that are grown here in St Andrew's area. <laughs> Of course, there is the actual term used in golfing, the bogey, which is one over par, as most of the people here know, and... Uh, Clement Floyd challenge. Hesitation. Yes, there was a hesitation. You did so yeah, well. about 14 seconds ago. <laughs> Thanks very much, Clement. You went for 48 kind. seconds. Uh, 48 seconds. Anyway, Clement, you have a correct challenge. Another point to you. 12 seconds are left for a bogey starting now. A bogey is the sort of name that was given to Humphrey Bogart, the famous actor. Tony Hawk's challenge. Wouldn't have been a bogey, it would have been H bogey. <laughs> a subtle but correct challenge, yes, he was known as bogey, not a bogey. <laughs> oh man. Five seconds for you, Tony, on bogey. Uh, sorry, on a bogey starting <laughs> now. A bogey means you've scored one over par. A double bogey means that you need to blow your nose. <laughs> So, uh, Tony Hawk speaking as the whistle again, the next to point, he's equal to Fred McCauley in second place. Our lead is still Clement Freud, and it's his turn to begin. Clement, the subject now, poker. I'm sure you're a good poker player, but tell us something about the game in just a minute, if you can, starting now. Little Willie in his bright blue sashes fell in the fire and was burnt to ashes. Now the room is cold and chilly. No one wants to poke poor... Well, I can't repeat the name again, but a poker is an implement with which you disturb the coals or wood on a fire in order to create more warmth for the people within sight of that furnace. Um, a poker is also an implement with which you can hit people or even golf balls. And at St. Andrews, it is no longer encouraged because there are the number one, two, and three woods, a certain... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hesitation. Oh, definitely. I think he was getting utterly confused and run down, but uh, <laughs> struggling nobly. Peter, you got in with 18 seconds on poker starting now. Well, a red-hot poker is a very useful thing to immerse <laughs> into a glass of beer, or better still, a tankard, perhaps of stout or bass, 
something of that kind. And it's supposed to be very healthy because some of the iron comes off into the liquid. <laughs> I have visions of the student body bringing red-hot pokers into the bar here of the student's union and shoving them in their drinks and seeing the potent effect of it. Peter, you kept going to the whistle when, gained the next to point. You're now equal with Tony Hawks and Fred McCauley in second place. Clement Freud's still in the lead, and Tony, it's your turn to begin. The subject, an oasis. Tell us something about that in just a minute. Starting now. Many years ago, I was leading an expedition of intrepid explorers across the Sahara, and on day two, we ran into some difficulties. We were completely unable to flag down a taxi. <laughs> When we did get one, he wouldn't take us, saying, I'm not going south of the oasis at this time of night. An oasis, of course, is a fertile place where you'll find water in a desert. It's also used metaphorically, talking about a bright event amongst gloominess. And what, this happened to me recently. I was reading Hello! magazine, and I stumbled across Nicholas Parsons celebrating his 50th year in show business. And this was an oasis amongst some of oh, the mum doesn't matter what I'm saying nobody's listening they're still applauding what I say uh, <laughs> Tell him a Freud challenge deviation I didn't hear what he said anyway though. he said no one was listening and I was listening <laughs> I have to ask you because of the audience reaction to your uh, remarks I, did you actually hesitate Tony? no but I did deviate which is what he just said Oh, I see. I thought he said hesitation. Right. All right, then. Very honest of you, Tony. Nine seconds for you on an oasis. Uh, Clement, starting now. After 50 years in show business, an oasis is probably the very best way to go. I mean, to be taken into the Gobi Desert. <laughs> Clement Freud, you've increased your lead at the end of that round. Peter Jones, your turn to begin. The subject... Humbug. Tell us something about that in this game, if you can, starting now. Well, a humbug is a very tiresome, irritating chap who misinterprets rules and laws and causes a lot of trouble for other people. Humbuggery is very prevalent <laughs> in this country, though many of the <clears throat> many of the humbugs that I've met have got soft centres, like their uh, <laughs> namesake, the uh, dessert sweet, which is pillow-shaped and smells of peppermint and taste of it very often. Uh, uh, humbugs. Uh, Tony Hawk's challenge. Well, I thought he could sort of ground to a halt there. Really. Is, is it hesitation? I did. I know he was carried away with his humbugs. 28 seconds available for humbug with you, Tony, starting now. How delighted I was to hear Peter Jones use the word humbuggery not long ago. As far as I can say, on Radio 4, I haven't heard that right enough. Ken uh, Floyd challenge. Repetition of heard. Yes, you did he yeah. heard it from Peter Jones and he heard it on Radio 4. 19 seconds, Clement. Humbug starting now. A person who commits humbuggery would be called a humbugger. <laughs> a man, a pederast with a speech impediment. And I thought that would get uh, a laugh. Tony Hawk's a chance. <laughs> well, I think you hesitated because you thought that would get a laugh. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're right, but he doesn't get a point. You get the point, and you get the subject, and there's seven seconds on humbug starting now. A humbugger is something that you eat when you're extraordinarily hungry. Now, that doesn't deserve to get a... <laughs> so, Tony Hawks, with extra points, including one as the whistle went, is moving forward, and he is now only three points behind our leader, Clement Freud. Fred McCauley, Peter Jones, the trainee behind him, and Fred begins the next round. Fred, very apt for the student body here, studies. You were at university? Yeah, tell me something about your studies in this game, starting now. Well, it would take me four years to tell you about my studies, but we're fortunate to be here in St. Andrews, where even as I speak, some of the students are taking notes because they find this more interesting than whatever subject they are, <laughs> particularly spending their time avoiding during term, uh, whether it's philosophy, psychology, maths, physics, <laughs> chemistry, some other science subject. Biology, perhaps. Languages, for example. English, French, Spanish, German, I don't know, Serbo-Croatian, Russian, Latin or Greek. The classics, as they're known. Medicine, perhaps. Dentistry. Engineering. For goodness sake, there's no 
Uh, Herman Freud challenge. Deviation. Why? There's no school of dentistry at St. Adam's. <laughs> There's obviously a faculty of pedantry. Yeah. <laughs> There's no school of dentistry, but he could have been studying medicine first with the idea of becoming a dentist later. To give you the benefit of the doubt, Clement, 19 seconds, studies with you starting now. Studies is where people study. They tend to be rooms with a desk. Mm. <laughs> obviously I've said enough. <laughs> with a desk, but nowhere to sit. Peter, you challenge first. Yes. Uh, studies is with you starting now. Well, there are brown studies. And uh, nude studies. And there are studies in contemplation and uh, <coughs> landscape. Same challenge. The, the recurrence of the word air again. I think yeah. it's the hesitation. Yeah. Very yes, long air yeah. uh, there. You yeah. cleverly got in, Fred, with one second to go on studies. Starting now. Counting. Uh, someone challenge. <laughs> Yes, Clement. I thought hesitation. <laughs> but actually, he actually was halfway through the word accountancy, the one subject he hadn't mentioned up to then. So, no, an incorrect challenge, and you have half a second, Fred, on studies starting now. Mm. Oh! <laughs> so, Fred, McCauley has got a lot of points of that round. He's now equal to Tony Hawks in second place, just behind our leader, Clement Freud. And Peter Jones in third place, Summer Balls, is the next subject. And when you talk about them, Clement, it's your turn, starting now. William O'Hagan Macduff Summer Balls was probably one of the least known reserve Hearts of Midlothian players in the immediate pre-war period when the aforementioned Scottish football team still played the W plan wherein the two wing forwards and the centre produced the... <laughs> uh, Tony Hawk's challenge while Clement Freud was actually demonstrating to the audience, which yeah. is not the best kind of radio. Uh, your challenge, Tony. Yes, I think it was a hesitation. Definitely. 36 seconds. Summer Balls is with you, Tony, starting now. As soon as we put the clocks back, I dispense with my summer balls and replace them with my winter ones. <laughs> this is a much better way of facing the cold period. When I was a student, I was invited to many magnificent summer balls. How splendid it was to see the young ladies there, to rush up, ask them what the capital of Poland was, and <laughs> take it from there, Berlin. Sometimes I'd take any other capital. Those are the way things went. <clears throat> but Clement Freud challenge. Repetition of capital. Yeah, there were too many <clears throat> capitals there, but obviously it was a capital idea you had. Uh, ten seconds, Clement. <laughs> you grab at every chance in this game, I can tell you. Ten seconds, summer balls with you, Clement, starting now. At Oxford and Cambridge, these are called commemoration <laughs> and May. But if you come north of the border, they boo when you mention the university. Perhaps should I should explain to our listeners, especially as we have so many abroad, that the ancient Scottish University of St. Andrews is only a few years younger than the two ancient English universities, and there's a great natural rivalry, but we know which is the superior because we visited them today. <laughs> and we haven't even had an invitation from the other two. <laughs> and we certainly won't get one now. <laughs> So Clement Freud has increased his lead at the end of that round. Tony Hawks, your turn to begin. The subject, getting plastered. Right. <laughs> oh, that's what you do up here, is it? Well, 60 seconds as usual, Tony, starting now. Why is it that packets of cigarettes are accompanied with cautionary messages, like smoking can damage your health, whereas alcohol has nothing? There should be a little sign on saying this lager might cause you to pick on someone much bigger than you. <laughs> Or drinking this bottle of whiskey will give you a thunderously bad headache because that is what getting plastered means today. It means getting drunk, like starting an evening like Tony Blair and ending it like Boris Yeltsin. <laughs> <laughs> the last time I got plastered myself was at Nicholas Parsons' 50th anniversary <laughs> in show business. 
It was a marvellous affair. I know I keep wanting to talk about it, but I can't tell you how magnificent it was to see him beaming away, not looking a day over 80. He was <laughs> tremendous. And I was drunk, so drunk they had to... Oh, yeah. Yes, I know. Is it a pity? <laughs> it was going so well. Clement, you challenge. Repetition, eight seconds. Getting faster. Uh. Fred, you challenge. Yeah, just before Clement starts, am I the only one that wasn't invited to this 50th <laughs> 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 A lot of invitations went out. Some must have got lost to Fred. <laughs> I will have a special party for you later. That's what I we'll look have to do. Forward to. <laughs> Eight seconds getting plastered with you, Clement, starting now. I quite enjoy getting plastered on Glenmorangie whiskey, which in the south is pronounced Morangi, whereas it should have got the orangey. <laughs> Clement Coy was again speaking as a whistle when gained the next point and has increased his lead at the end of that round. Quite a commanding lead he has now as Peter Jones takes up the challenge with the next subject. It's sirens, Peter. Tell us something about those in this game, starting now. Well, I think of those mythical creatures, rather like mermaids in a way. They're women who sing and lure sailors who are probably desperate for sex of some kind <laughs> uh, to follow them and they consequently drown. Now, what these creatures, I mean the sirens, have, uh, what their object is, I don't really know. I've never, why don't they uh, want to go any further than that? But they, d <laughs> they don't seem to. And, of course, there's the air raid sirens, which <clears throat> are quite different altogether. And they s <laughs> signal the arrival of enemy aircraft overhead. And you're supposed to rush down into the underground or the cellar or whatever you've got, Anderson Shelter. And then, if you have any luck at all, you meet a siren down there. <laughs> and then... <coughs> what? Uh, uh, Tony Hawks has managed to help you, I think. Well, I, I thought um, I'd just help him out there. Yeah. He just seemed to be you struggling. You should have kept there. going for another two seconds, no, Peter. That's all. You'd have had 60 oh. seconds. Oh, hang well, on. I'll a... repeat something, Peter, and you can get back in again. Really? What? Two seconds, Tony, starting now. Sirens. Peter. 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 <laughs> yes. He challenged Peter. He did. My God, you were quick off the mark there, Peter. <laughs> One second, Peter, on silence, starting now. Don't listen to them. <laughs> so, Peter has moved dramatically forward in that uh, last round. He's still in fourth place, but he's... Um, <laughs> He's only one point behind Fred McCauley, who's only one point behind Tony Hawks, who are a few points behind our leader, who's still Clement Freud. And Fred McCauley, your turn to begin. The subject, tourists. Get quite a lot of them up in St. Andrews, because they've got the golf, they've got this beautiful place. And um, because the students, of course, they recognise them and they trip them up as they go past them. <laughs> T tourists, 60 seconds, Fred, if you can, starting now. Well, if I was Tony Hawks, I'd probably say something like, Tourists are the things I have at the end of my arms to stop my hands flying off. But as you can tell from the reaction we got from our lovely audience here when we mentioned the word, we don't like them very much. <laughs> they're complete bloody pains in the necks, apparently. People that come here, they're no more than the lifeblood of the economy, but we don't want them. We give them the traditional St. Andrew's welcome when they turn up at our bed and breakfast. What do you want? <laughs> Why can't you do it someplace else? But I suppose since you've come here, you might as well stay anyway. I've been a tourist before, but that was someplace else. <laughs> I can't really remember. <laughs> Peter challenged. Uh, hesitation. Yes, Peter, there was a hesitation. Twenty seconds are still available for you, and it is still tourists starting now. Very few people actually admit to being tourists themselves, I've noticed, when traveling. They prefer to think of themselves as travelers, because it's all these other masses of people who are touring. And they usually subscribe to some big organization like Pontins or something like that. <laughs> and they <laughs> Peter Jones, speaking as a whistlewind, gained that all-important extra point and has moved forward from fourth to third place. He's just overtaken Fred McCauley. Tony Hawks is one point ahead. And, unfortunately, I've just discovered we have no more time to play Just a Minute. But, I know, I tell you what, I've got a marvellous idea. I think we should come back to St. Andrews and do another recording here. <laughs> right. 
And now you've got the first warning. Why don't you go out and get the first seats for that recording? <laughs> Where ahead of those three in the lead was Clement Freud. So with most points, we say, Clement, you are the winner this week. And in just a minute, it's not so much the points, it's our contribution. I want to thank all four of them, the marvellous contribution, Clement Freud, Tony Hawks, Peter Jones, Fred McCauley. We want to thank our audience who've come, given up time from studying <laughs> and drinking, <laughs> to come into the student union and enjoy this recording of just a minute. I want to thank Elaine Wigley for keeping the score, blowing her whistle so delicately after the 60 seconds. Also, Ian Messiter, who created the game, keeps us in work. And also, Anne Jobson, our producer and director, who does such a marvellous job trying to keep us in order. But from all of us here, until we all go on the air again to play just a minute, thank you and goodbye! <laughs> And at the same time next week, the Just a Minute team will be Clement Freud, Peter Jones, Paul Merton and Derek Nemo. <laughs>